Yes, sir. Is it a fox in costume back there? He is indeed. It's a hot job, but. <laughs> Which side do you want? Well, Vivian just came out. She said, oh. "I'm going to put the TV lights on. It's going to be fine." Yeah, she was, she was sitting this early today, right? How would you oh, here we go. Now. Color. Love it. Thank you. I guess I have to move my. Where is my? Okay. Someone's going to break one of those well, in the yeah, next we couple were of months. Supposed to get everybody's <laughs> credit card for damage deposit before the meeting. <laughs> you better Sorry, no say such luck. <laughs> Just dock our pay. I mean, you can't. Yeah, thank you. Well, oh, I like this video a lot better than the other one. I can actually see the front light. Yeah, <laughs> it is better. Away from us. This is great. It is better. <laughs> Got an extra, if you got an extra uh, coffee. Otherwise, I can follow along on my email. The quality of the light was better, although it's very light. I'm good, thank you. The light was bright. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. Uh, this being Monday, the 7th of July, 7th of August. <laughs> and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here. This is our first meeting uh, since our recess in Thank you. I ask Councilman Davis if he would lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. May we rise, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Here. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Councilman Reese. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before we get started with most of the rest of the agenda tonight, I wanted to share with the council and with the members of the public who are present as well as those watching um, a poem that I discovered online uh, about two weeks ago. I believe it was originally written at the third Thursday uh, art event here in downtown Durham. And um, I, I really felt that it was um, fitting for the place that we find ourselves in this city right now as we open up a new uh, political season uh, for the next uh, round of city elections. Uh, the poet is a local uh, dignitary, famous uh, person here in Durham, the Poetry Fox, who has been writing spontaneous street poetry at events and gatherings uh, in this area for over five years, everything from kid birthday parties to street festivals to midnight masquerade revelers and Duke Hospital cancer patients. Give the fox a word, bam, get a poem with that word in it. The fox is also Chris Vitello, an award-winning arts writer and chief contributor for Indie Week. I'd like to ask the Poetry Fox to come up now to the podium here and uh, read the poem uh, that he uh, wrote. I'd like it to be recognized that I did that without tripping on anything. So. <laughs> first order of business, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I want to thank you guys for this opportunity. Uh, th this poem was written at a third Friday, um, and it was sort of through a partnership through uh, the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau that Kara Russo asked me to, to read at, and uh, Duke's Artstigators program that Amy Yunell runs. Uh, it's sort of a great example of a public-private uh, partnership um, and the kind of great cultural stuff that can come from it. So it was a busy night. Uh, how I work is somebody gives me a word and I immediately write a poem with that word in it and I was given the word Durham and uh, I wrote this. Place names are nouns. People, places, and things the stern teachers taught us. But some places are really verbs because they never sit still enough to mean the same thing. Durham, the city of people running into each other on the street and starting a project or company 10 minutes later. Durham, the city of fences leaned on for a conversation over tomatoes and politics. Durham, where we trot our problems right out so we can solve them together. No nouns here, only verbs conjugating all day long. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I'm going to ask the Councilwoman Johnson if you go to the podium. Um, as most of you probably know, we lost a young man few weeks ago in a motorcycle accident. And there was a memorial service Saturday that I, happened, I was able to attend very briefly. But Councilwoman Johnson has uh, prepared a proclamation. And if you don't mind, could present it, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is a, a resolution to um, recognize and honor Umar Muhammad, uh, who's a local activist who uh, was killed um, a few weeks ago in a motorcycle accident. Um, are there folks here from his family? It's been kind of a busy weekend, so I wasn't sure if anyone would be able to come. Okay, um, there was a memorial service for him on Saturday with over 500 people in attendance over at the Haytai Heritage Center, and it really showed uh, the impact that he's had in the community and how many people um, really, really valued his contributions um, and his work. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this, and um, we'll make sure his family gets this resolution. Whereas Umar Musa Muhammad was born in Durham, North Carolina on January 7th, 1987 to Joyce and Musa Muhammad. And whereas Umar attended Durham Public Schools and whereas Umar was a local leader of All of Us or None NC, a state chapter of a human rights organization advocating for current and formerly incarcerated people. And whereas he was an advocate for the Ban the Box movement um, to have questions about criminal history removed from employment applications, advocated across the region for Spirit House's harm-free zones movement for community resiliency and restorative justice. And whereas Umar was a leader in Durham's Fostering Alternative Drug Enforcement, FADE Coalition, which works to end the racial disparities of the war on drugs in Durham and other forms of police violence, such as racial profiling, racial disparities in marijuana arrests, and the killings of black and brown people. And whereas Umar worked as a community organizer with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice from 2014 to 2017, where he organized clean slate clinics to clear old criminal records for hundreds of people in Durham and North Carolina. And in July 2017, he joined Forward Justice to become the lead organizer and campaign strategist in order to work on national issues through the formerly incarcerated convicted people and families movement. And whereas Umar participated in a City of Durham Human Relations Commission panel on the impact of the Durham County Jail on the residents of the city and shared his experience and wisdom with the community about the impact of incarceration on our, on our residents. And whereas Umar was a member of the Jamaat Ibad al-Rahman Mosque and a member of Curve Assassins Motorcycle Club and a member of the Advisory Committee for the Durham County Criminal Justice Resource Cl Center. And whereas colleagues and friends described Umar as eager, earnest, and passionate, an extraordinary person, and an unapologetic truth teller, and he was known for his charismatic personality, his infectious smile, and courageous leadership, his love for Durham, his dedication to his community. And whereas Umar was a consistent advocate for the needs and rights of formerly incarcerated people in the city of Durham, and his voice was instrumental in the implementation of policies to require the Durham Police Department to use written consent search forms in order to reduce racial disparities in traffic stops and searches. And whereas he advocated to the world every day that people are not the sum of their worst mistakes and embodied this truth through his consistent and dedicated work to make Durham a stronger community that values all people. 
And whereas Umar is survived by his partner, Krista, stepsons, Christian and Christopher, daughter, Ella Asada, parents, Joyce and Musa, siblings, Nikki, Hadia, and Nasheed. He will also be missed by his two grandmothers, two nieces, four nephews, aunts, uncles, cousins, and many other loved ones. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Durham City Council that this city council pauses in a moment of silence in memory of Umar Musa Muhammad. That this governing body pays tribute to his life and his contributions to the community. And that this resolution be spread upon the official minutes of this governing body. And it's signed by Mayor Bell. Thank you. Councilman Johnson, that was well prepared, well written, well spoken. Uh, uh, most of us had an opportunity. Umar really appreciated him as an individual, and so, of course, he was the person this community will miss, uh, just as his family will miss him. I will ask are there Uh, asking the clerk, do we need to vote on that, Ann? Yes, sir. All right, entertain the motion. So moved. Second. That's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor of the motion and the I'm sorry. We got, <laughs> probably, we got new gadgets up here. Uh, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. All right. Are there announcements by members of the council? Uh, let me make one announcement. As probably most of you know, we each year do an evaluation of our three employees that the city council hires, uh, the city manager, the city attorney, and the city clerk. Uh, we had their annual evaluations on July the 27th of this year. And today in closed session, we reviewed the evaluations with the respective employees. And as a result of their evaluations, the council has recommended <coughs> salary increases for the city manager, the city attorney, and the city clerk. They recommended Salary for the city manager is $234,137.89. Uh, the recommended salary for the city attorney is $215,368.22. And the recommended salary for the city clerk is $124,319.67. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve those salary increases. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, again, will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? It passes seven to zero. Okay. Let me recognize the city manager for any prior time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone, and, uh, and welcome back, as the mayor said. Uh, you may have noticed uh, in the council chambers uh, look a little bit different than the last time you were here in June. Hopefully the work done over the last month since our last council meeting are as visible on television and online as they are here in person. We now have a new high definition broadcast quality council chamber. Among the changes are the new LED TV lights which are pretty bright up here right now and room lights which are more energy efficient and make a big difference in the brightness of the room there's new microphones, new high-definition cameras, a new vote board system, and larger monitors behind the council chambers that have closed captioning. Also, the council member monitors were replaced with horizontal ones and uh, better views of the audience. The monitors in the lobby were also rewired for closed captioning and better audio, and any Apple users, uh, product users, will now be able to use their iPhones and iPads to watch the web uh, to watch the web uh, stream live. In the past, that was not possible. 
I do want to take just a minute to uh, thank the many departments that were involved in this upgrade over the summer. Certainly Beverly Thompson. I'd also like to recognize uh, Vivian Cruz O'Doherty of Public Affairs, Donna Maskell, the General Services Department, and our own city clerk, Ann Gray, for leading this effort over the last month, and I think it's going to be a big improvement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I would just like to <coughs> recognize that Umar's family uh, just came in and joined us. They're in the back. Good evening. Good evening. We, we just had a resolution that this council adopted, a resolution prepared by Councilwoman Johnson, and as indicated, uh, that resolution will be presented to you as members of the family. But we all uh, offer our condolences on Umar's passing. Uh, I think all of us knew him at one point in time, have an had an opportunity to meet with him. And there's no question he's a loss for this community and as much as he's a loss for you <coughs> as a family. Uh, while he was yours, we also considered him ours also. So please accept our condolences. Mayor. Uh, I, I would like the public to know that we will be offering a resolution in memory of F is still um, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements by council members before we go to the prioritizing side of the city attorney? Was that all the priorities? That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, prioritizing side of the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, the city clerk, are there any prioritizing? No items, Mr. Mayor. In that case, we will proceed with the agenda, and I will read each item. Uh, the consent agenda is an item, a part of the agenda that can be approved for a single vote unless a council member, a member of the council, a member of the audience, uh, chooses to pull an item, and at the appropriate time, we will discuss it. Uh, the first item, consent agenda, is the item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two is the budget measures, performance audit, June 2017. Item three is capital assets performance audit dated June 2017. Item four is citywide safety performance audit dated June 2017. Item five is city, county, ICMA, local government management fellow in a local agreement. Item six is 2016 Historic Preservation Commission annual report. Item seven is 2016 Durham City County Appearance Commission annual report. Item eight is 2016 Durham Environmental Affairs Board Annual Report. Item nine is the 2016 Planning Commission Annual Report. Item 10 is 2016 Durham Board of Adjustment Annual Report. Item 11 is 2016 Durham Open Space and Trails Commission Annual Report. Item 12 is City Code Amendment Sunday morning alcoholic beverage sales and I'll pull that item. Item 13 is a resolution providing approval of a multifamily housing facility known as Daymar Court Apartments in the city of Durham, North Carolina, and the financing thereof of, with Housing Authority of the city of Durham multifamily housing revenue bonds. Item 14 is a resolution providing approval of a multifamily housing facility known as Maureen Road Apartments in the city of Durham, North Carolina and the financing thereof with Housing Authority of the City of Durham Multifamily Housing Revenue Bonds. Item 15 is the pass-through agreements with Orange County, Durham County, Town of Chapel Hill, Go Triangle, and Durham Center for Senior Life for multiple Federal Transit Administration grants administered by the Durham Chapel Hill Carver Metropolitan Planning Organization. Item 16, a supplemental agreement number two between the city and BHB Engineering NC PC for the North Carolina 54 corridor study. Item 17 is the emergency action plan for critical sewer main crossing amendment number one to professional engineering services contract with KF Carter Engineering Company. Item 18 is correction to water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2017-2018. Item 19 is the bid report for May 2017. Item 20 is a bid report for June 2017. Item 21 is a construction contract with DW Ward Construction Company, Inc. for Maplewood Cemetery Improvements. 
Item 22 is proposed acquisition of approximately 1,476 square feet of permanent right-of-way and 4,445 square feet of temporary construction easement across a portion of 1304 and 1308 West North Carolina Highway 54, PID 135916 and 135917 from FMR Properties, LLC. Item 22 is grant agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation for the West Elevate Creek Trail Phase 2 project. Item 2 is a downtown parking garage project, construction manager at risk, pre-qualification procedures, resolution. Item 25 is construction services contract with Braden Integrated Security for the citywide security select sites slash video surveillance upgrades and implementation project. Item 26 is a amendment to professional services contract with Alert, Alert and Associates Networking Division, Inc. for phase three of citywide security project security improvements, design, and implementation at Durham City Hall. Item 28, 28 is a contract for athletics booking agent. Item 29 is a contract with Morris and McDaniel, Inc. to conduct pr promotion testing and assessment services. Item 30 is a utility extension agreement with D.R. Horton, Inc. to serve Southern Point townhomes. Item one is a recommendation for completion of stormwater infrastructure in Ravenstone and Stone Hills Estate Subdivision, and I'll pull that item. Item 32 is a resolution authorizing the Public Works Department to develop a certified third-party permitting and inspection program and to certify qualified third-party consultants. Uh, I just noticed that I have a card here for item five on the consent agenda. Uh, Charging of neighborhoods. Um, I'll, no, I'm sorry, this is item 31 also. Okay. Item 33 is contract amendment number one for SW 16 2017 sidewalk repairs. Item 34 is a contract ST 282 mm -hmm. 2017 mm -hmm. street repairs and repaving project award. Item 35 is a contract SW 47D Maureen Road bike and pedestrian improvements. Tip number C4928. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Wait, um, um, would you pull item 33, please, the contract for sidewalk repairs? All right. Item 35 is a contract SW 47, 47D, Marin Road, Bike and Pedestrian Improvements. Tip number C4928. Item 36 is contract SW 44D. Kaufman Fletcher Road, Bike and Pedestrian Improvements, tip number U4726HO. Item 37 is Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, HMGP 4167-0009-R Resolution. Item 38 is Munis Software Annual Support and License Agreement for 2018. Item 41 can be found on the General Business Agenda. And items 43 through 47 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. I would entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with the, with the exception of item 31 and item 33. So moved, Mr. Second. Mayor. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? I'm sorry, Dr. Wilcox. 12. Uh, will you close the vote? It passes seven to zero. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go to the general business agenda public hearing. No, general business agenda item 41, property tax relief deferred loan program. Mayor Bell, members of council, Reginald Johnson, director of Department of Community Development. Item number 41 is the Property Tax Relief Deferred Loan Program discussed at the work session. The purpose of this program is to provide guidelines for the Property Tax Relief Deferred Loan Program designed to uh, assist eligible homeowners whose property taxes have uh, increased due to an impact of City of Durham neighborhood revitalization. I will stand ready for any questions that have ready to be asked. Let, let me ask other. Well, Reginald, let me say this. Uh, we had this item at our work session. Uh, we deferred any comments on it, primarily because two of our council members left 
Uh, we did hear, have questions from the audience, but I, I think it would be better if, if you could present what has been proposed, if you don't mind. Yes, I'd be glad to. So I would say as the presentation has been, is being um, uploaded earlier this year, end of last year, the uh, citizens of Southside uh, neighborhood in particular um, presented before the city council and ch talked about the increase in taxes due to the uh, neighborhood uh, revitalization that had occurred. And after that uh, discussion and presentation, the city council asked the administration to prepare a proposed uh, deferred, a proposed loan program, a proposed program to uh, engage in some assistance for tax relief. So after some evaluation, the, the uh, administration and Department of Community Development proposed the program, which I'll share, share with you now. The City of Durham uh, Property uh, Tax Relief Program will offer deferred loans uh, to eligible uh, long-term homeowners who experience an increase in property taxes due to the impact uh, occurring from the city's revitalization or home improvement efforts in Southside, Southwest Central Durham, and Northeast Central Durham target areas. The purpose of this uh, program, like I said, is grounded in the strategies that were adopted by the city council uh, relative to affordable housing. And this program uh, proceeds out of a policy that we focused on targeted areas to assist purpose, purpose with persons or households with uh, tax increases. And it's consistent with the goals and strategies that were adopted by the council. The proposed program guidelines were created to assist the Department of Community Development staff in administering the program. I'll first start with the borrow ed eligibility. The household income must be 80% or below uh, of the HUD uh, median income, area median income. There is no asset limitation. Housing costs must be above 30% of the total household gross income. A property tax increase must be the result of direct city investment in the defined target areas, and this does not include private investment. In terms of borrow eligibility, applicant must have resided in their home prior to the qualifying event and for a minimum of five years. Eligible homeowners must have applied for the homestead exemption, circuit breaker, a disabled veterans exclusion or other available tax relief programs prior to applying for the deferred loan program. Homeowners may be approved for loan assistance for a maximum of four years with a maximum of four annual disbursements. Homeowners must have their incomes recertified annually to verify ongoing program eligibility. Eligible properties. The property must be located in a target area where increased property values are were the result of a direct city investment, whereas the property is located within 500 foot, feet radius of the investment. Revitalization projects or home improvements must have occurred between 2010 and 2015. That's inclusive of those years. The loan will have a 0% interest rate. The loan will be deferred until the property is sold, transferred, or is no longer occupied by the borrower. The loan amount will be def the difference between the amount of the previous year's property tax obligation and the 2016 property tax ab obligation. The deferred loan terms, the increase in tax obligations must be a minimum of 10%. The borrower must occupy the home as their principal residence and must continue to do so, un do so until the home is sold or transferred. A deed of trust or lien from the borrower in favor of the city will be part of the loan documentation. Additional annual disbursements will increase the amount of the principal secured by the deed of trust. Uh, additional uh, deferred loan terms. The city will look to recapture 
the entire balance of the loan term if the loan is sold, transferred, or if a qualifying disqualifying event occurs. However, in the event that the home is sold, the city would not look to recapture more than what is available from the net proceeds of the sale. Net proceeds are equal to the sale price minus superior liens and closing costs associated with the sale. Upon the death of the homeowner or borrower, the heirs to the property that receive the loan assistance may apply for and receive additional loan assistance or continued loan deferment if the heir is income eligible and continues to reside in the property. The total estimate uh, in terms of cost for the program uh, is $585,977, and this is based upon an estimate of the number of properties that are tax increase, face tax increases in the area, and also what percentage, an estimated percentage of households that will, may participate in the program. So this is a projection. The final slide I have before you uh, shows the uh, target areas that have been previously adopted by council. It also shows the, uh, the blue dots are the investments that have occurred uh, for affordable housing within the uh, zones. And then the additional rings uh, that you show that are in gold are the 500 foot radius from those investments. And that concludes my formal presentation. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, several people that have signed up to speak on this item, uh, but before they speak, I want to ask you, are there any questions or comments by, by the council at this time? If not, then I would recognize persons who have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, you each have three minutes. As I call your name, you proceed to the podium to my right. Uh, Sandy Demery, Anthony Jones, Jim Savara, Enjoy milk in that order. My name is Sandy Demery, and I live at 819B North Street. And um, I'm part of the North Street community that's, I think a lot of you know, is for people with and without disabilities to all live together and support each other. Um, it was crap. It was all boarded up, um, awful looking. Um, before uh, it got redeveloped and renovated. Um, so, of course, our taxes have gone up, and we assumed that. Um, I hadn't given any thought to my neighbors. It's kind of foolish. Uh, we've lost a lot of our renter neighbors through gentrification. And now I'm concerned about the homeowner neighbors that we have. And um, one of my neighbors is with me tonight. Um, we thought, or I thought at the time, that they were going to be grandfathered in at the old tax rates, and I don't think that's what's happened. Um, I personally support Steve Shule's new idea, I think I've heard about that anyways, about um, a proposal for a grant for Southside. Um, Southside I'm a big fan of, uh, especially after serving on the steering committee for Rolling Hills. Um, but I also think that we need to step back and rethink citywide um, about tax relief. Um, for instance, in our neighborhood, uh, we've been impacted by both city um, activity as well as market activity. But we're not inside the city target area. We're two blocks over from Northeast Central Durham. So uh, at that, I'll just hand it over to Anthony. Good evening. Uh, I, I am Anthony Jones, and I live in this area that she's been talking about in Northwood Circle. Uh, since this revitalization came upon us, my taxes have increased 80%. They said if it don't work, if it's too much, appeal. I appealed, and thanks for the paperwork, but it didn't do me any good. Just the same. And as it's going now, I have no idea what to expect. And I'm, I share this with some of the other homeowners in that area. Uh, if you're, I am retired and my income is fixed and you give me a piece of paper telling me how to pay my taxes, but you don't tell me how to get the money to pay the taxes. Because that's the best I can tell you. Whatever you do for me, I greatly appreciate it. I thank you much.
Good evening, uh, Jim Savara, 1114 Woodburn Road. Uh, I am uh, come to speak tonight uh, on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit, and I want to encourage you to not approve this proposal, uh, but rather to consider how we can make it better. Uh, Durham should create a local tax relief program, uh, and I want to credit the mayor and the, and the community development department for recognizing that there are ways that we can that we can develop our own program, but let's do it right. There are many shortcomings with the proposed uh, program. It is unfair for persons outside the boundaries of the three target areas, and we just heard an example of that. Uh, there are lots of cases of people that are close to those boundaries, uh, and uh, they don't get uh, uh, assistance. But let's recognize that the changes the city has made downtown and throughout the city uh, have impacted the property values uh, that, uh, that homeowners have. And in areas that were formerly low income, these gentrifying forces are pushing up values and pushing up the tax burden. And this is a destabilizing force. Um, so let's make, let's provide assistance. Let's look for a way to provide assistance to low income homeowners throughout the city that are paying excessive taxes. Now, the, the, com the Community Development Department proposal does not address this issue uh, of excessive taxes, paying too large a percentage of income in property tax. It addresses only an increase. There are people who are paying a, a burdensome amount, not because it's an increase. They've been paying that amount for some time. Let's address that underlying problem. The most serious uh, limitation, I think, with this approach is that it doesn't really solve anything. After four years, those high taxes are still going to be waiting uh, for the homeowners that have been able to benefit from it. Uh, are we going to add more loans on top of the four? Um, I think you know, we need to think again about how to broaden the coverage, think about the basis for providing that assistance, uh, and link it to income. Uh, earlier this year, the council approved, endorsed the idea in its legislative agenda of expanding the state circuit breaker tax to cover all families, not just those that are elderly and handicapped. The principles on which that kind of program are based have not been included in the Community Development Department proposal. Uh, so let's rethink, uh, let's include those and that the key elements are a cap on, a cap on taxes based on a percent of income, uh, let's make it an ongoing program without this limit to four years, um, and uh, we, will, uh, we will all benefit in the long term by doing that. The benefits would be those for people that are 50 to 80 percent, that are, that are under 50 percent or under 80 percent of area median income. Um, in the meantime, let's recognize the special burden that residents of Southside have been through with the massive uh, renovation that has occurred there uh, and do something about their taxes from last year. Thank you. You're welcome. Joy Mickle. Good evening. Um, I'm Joy Mickle. I'm also with the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit, and I am in favor of creating a program for helping homeowners who are having trouble with the increase in taxes due to development, especially those for Southside. I, however, am in favor of creating uh, the circuit breaker type of program instead of a loan program. Um, as a rule, general rule, I don't really think that giving loans to people having trouble paying their taxes is a good um, policy move. And I think that um, there is a better way that we could create a program that helps everyone in the city. And I think that, I know that the housing stabilization program that Jim Savara pulled together originally was a grant program. I'm not sure when and how it changed to a loan program, but I think that the, it, uh, with it not having any interest, uh, the loan program not having interest in basically being probably more expensive to administer um, uh, that way, why not just do a grant program? I'm not sure I understand that. Um, I think that um, the council should reject this proposal um, and uh, or substitute this motion, uh, substitute this program, this loan program 
for a grant program, and then go about the work of creating something citywide, um, like the circuit breaker type program that Jim mentioned, and I think um, Councilman Shule has uh, forwarded also to the council. Um, I think that something that limits homeowners exposure to two or three percent is is the is a much better way of helping homeowners than putting it into debt um, and then in four years they're they're faced with the same tough choices of high taxes um, if and also the fact that uh, if we do create some type of program that limits tax exposure we're really helping to slow gentrification displacement in a serious way um, this program is a, is a short fix. Um, I, I, I really don't think that it's good policy to give loans to, to people having trouble paying their bills. Um, I just think that uh, going back to the drawing board a little bit and, and putting together something that makes a little bit more sense policy-wise is a better move. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me, that, they were all the people that Sign up to speak. I'm going to recognize our persons on the council. I have some comments that I'll, I'll make last. Recognize Councilman Moffitt, the mayor, Councilman Shule in that order, and the mayor pro tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to just say that I, I echo some of the comments we've heard tonight. I've had some concerns about this. This is relatively modest amounts of relief. It's really only for a small portion. It's only for the tax increase. It's and uh, as as loans and not only the issues that they've talked about, about lending to people who are already in low-income houses, uh, low-income households, but also it's expensive to administer to keep track of everything. The 500-foot uh, radius has bothered me because it, it's, you can live 10 houses away and be outside that radius. Um, I think that's too small. I've been troubled by the fact that it, that it has a double layer of limitation. You have to be within 500 feet and live within one of these areas. And um, at the same time, I don't want to keep sending it back to staff. So those are my comments at this time. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shul and the Mayor Pro Tem. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about the housing stabilization program we're going to be voting on tonight. And uh, I sent this, what I'm about to say here to my colleagues uh, earlier today and I, I really appreciate the work on the staff of the staff on this over the last several months our staff has been trying to craft a program that meets a complicated set of criteria and also responds to the council's wishes that we've expressed uh, both informally and formally at, at work sessions over these last several months I'm in strong support of figuring out a comprehensive efficient equitable and cost-effective program to keep our low-income homeowners in their homes. And I know that is a goal that all of my colleagues share. After a lot of reflection, I don't think the program in front of us tonight is the best we can do. Um, I do think it's a really good effort, uh, but I don't think it's the best we can do. And I'm afraid uh, that if we vote for this program, we're going to be locking ourselves into a long-term loan program that we, will, we may well regret having adopted. So to cut to the chase, uh, I believe we ought to simply vote tonight to give the Southside homeowners grants to cover the difference between their 2015 and 2016 property taxes. And we should then take our time to get a comprehensive housing stabilization program right, one that considers home repairs as well as tax relief with the advantage of having a new housing director on board. We haven't had our housing director position filled in a long time. Uh, and uh, when we fill that position, it should be soon, that would be very helpful. Uh, I've spelled out below what I think the details of this one-year pro grant program should be, which I'll say in a moment. Uh, I, I think it should be simple, it should be easy to administer, and it should be inexpensive to taxpayers. Um, the creation of this program is the kind of problem that shows why governing is harder than slogans. We all know that we want housing stabilization for our low-income homeowners. That's, that's the easy part is to say that. Social policy involving public expenditures to help one low-income subgroup is hard to get right. Uh, in the case of the policy in front of us now, 
We've got a subgroup that is, in my opinion, fairly arbitrarily defined. We have significant loan closing costs for very small loans, so the efficiency of the program is very low. We're leaving out people who are not defined as housing burden, but whose home ownership is still threatened by rising property taxes. We don't have a good handle on the potential long-term costs. And we're not looking comprehensively at the best way, and this is, I think, the most important thing, we're not looking comprehensively at the best way to spend our scarce affordable housing fund dollars to help keep people in their homes. We need to consider home repair spending needs, too, and how our total housing stabilization spending should best be configured. What is the right balance between our spending on tax relief versus home repairs for low-income homeowners? Which has the best chance of keeping them in their homes over the long term? In short, I think we need to spend more time to get this right, and we're about to get uh, soon some more in-house expertise to help us do this. We all know that any local housing stabilization program involving tax relief is another Durham workaround, a problem that should be solved at the state level. The state's elderly disabled homestead exemption provides significant property tax relief to low-income seniors or people with a disability. Ideally, the state mitigation program would simply be extended to all low-income homeowners. Instead, Durham is trying to find our own local progressive solution but as we do, let's try to find the right solution. So in the interim, I think we ought to go back to where this whole process began with the low-income Southside homeowners who brought this need to us in the first place. In their case, their taxes have gone up significantly as a direct result of an enormous city investment in their neighborhood, a much larger investment than the city has made in any other neighborhood. Their situation is unique. While we are figuring out how to craft the best possible comprehensive housing stabilization policy, which will include tax relief and home repairs, we need to go ahead now and provide tax relief to the one group of low-income homeowners whom we know are significantly affected by the city's enormous direct investment, and that is Southside's low-income homeowners. I propose that this assistance come in the form of a grant to those homeowners in the Southside area, as described on the staff's current map who are at or below 60% of the area median income. To be eligible, homeowners must have lived in their home for at least five years, and their property taxes must have gone up at least 10% from 2015 to 2016. The grant would be to cover the increase in property taxes from 2015 to 2016, minus any tax relief already provided to these homeowners through the state circuit breaker programs. This would be a one-year program covering the 2016 property taxes only and we should further direct the staff to come back to us with a comprehensive housing stabilization program during this next fiscal year, during this fiscal year, so that we can deliberate on this program during next year's budget sessions. So that's my proposal, and um, I hope my colleagues will consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman mm -hmm. Sewell. Recognize the mayor pro, pro uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to hear from some folks from Southside. Were you gonna speak, Camille? Ms. Faust? Nobody from Southside. Le um, when, when the residents of Southside came to us initially asking for tax relief, there were a predominance of black women heads of household. Um, people who were of low to moderate income, who because of our work there or our partnering with others were suffering uh, because of the escalated taxes. Now, I tend now, we talk so much about racial equity. I tend to look at this through a racial equity lens and I wonder if that group had been from some other ethnicity or race, would we be going through this tonight? I am not willing to change the program that was originally uh, shared with us by staff. However, if we want to do something later, I look at the cost and uh, other sorts of considerations, I'm willing to do that. But I'm, 
ready to move on what staff uh, has presented because I don't want Durham to be perceived as a place where uh, we don't listen seriously uh, at the concerns of people who really need it most. Now, I know that Southside has suffered quite a bit over the years. And I think that um, just that location enough has suffered sufficiently. And they are now due uh, some burden relief. And that's where I am in my walk. Recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank um, my colleague, Councilmember Shule, for coming forward with this alternative proposal about how to address this particular agenda item. As all my colleagues know, we have been wrestling with this uh, for quite some time. Uh, I know that when I was uh, first sworn into this office 608 days ago, this was one of the issues that was foremost on my mind uh, was the recent, with respect to the recent property revaluation, what would happen to the tax burdens for working families, the property tax burdens for working families in this city. And uh, I think we've seen through the advocacy of the folks uh, who are here from the South Side neighborhood, we saw some very acute examples. And that's why, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I am in support of uh, Council Member Schull's proposal because it would provide the South Side homeowners with even more relief than the proposal that is on our agenda tonight. Uh, that proposal, which has been port, put forward by staff after a lot of hard work and in response to, uh, quite frankly, a variety of opinions on this uh, council, um, the, uh, has been, would saddle these Southside homeowners with, um, with, with debt instead of providing them actual uh, tax relief. And um, as I've said in other uh, meetings where we've discussed this, I don't, simply don't understand the rationale uh, of uh, providing city funds to all sorts of private entities for a perceived economic benefit while being unwilling to extend the same uh, type of, uh, of public investment in some of our uh, most long-standing uh, Durham residents who have made con incredibly uh, deep and lasting contributions to our, to our community. Um, and that's why I support the proposal. The other, the other thing I wanted to add here is that the, the staff proposal was designed uh, to maximize the certainty that the city is acting within its authority here. Uh, we heard at our last work session from one of our uh, city attorneys and, their, and his staff um, that that nexus between public investments by the city of Durham and affordable housing um, and the area in which this program would, from which the eligibility would spring, uh, was premised on the theory that uh, where the city uh, puts public dollars to uh, into, the, into a community for the purposes of, of, of increasing the amount of affordable housing there, that it would be paradoxical, I'm getting sound effects, it would be paradoxical uh, to allow those investments to create unaffordability in the surrounding area uh, as a result of increasing property values. Um, I think that, uh, that analysis is very sound and I appreciate the city manager's office from putting that before us. But I think it's just as sound to say that public investments over the last 15 to 20 years in the downtown core, uh, investments that have reaped incredible benefits for this city um, and which members of this council were very uh, brave to stand up for. Um, but those investments also create um, areas of, of new rising unaffordability in neighborhoods that surround the downtown core. And I believe uh, it would also be paradoxical for us to have said, we're going to invest millions of dollars in the downtown core in private developers and um, not have the ability uh, to ameliorate the effects of that downstream uh, once those investments reap benefits for us and once we begin to see uh, increasing property values uh, in that area. That's why I believe uh, though the argument is perhaps strongest where the city has made its affordable housing investments, I still believe the argument is strong and sustainable um, that uh, a broader area of, of eligibility <coughs> should be applied to this program. I've, as I've also said, I believe that grants are in much, uh, and as Joy Mickle said, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't really understand the logic of using debt to defray um, property taxes. So uh, the last thing I wanted to add is just to echo what Council Member Shule said about how difficult this is. Um, I understand full well and hear from taxpayers all the time that essentially we are trying to short circuit or work around um, a state system that is generally designed to prevent us from achieving progressive goals with respect to the property tax. 
Um, but I believe that in this area, given the arguments uh, that we will have at our disposal about public good and public purpose, I believe it would be appropriate to adopt a wider program. That's why I support Council Member Shule's proposal to do um, a short-term grant program immediately for the South Side homeowners for the last property tax and then move forward with a broader analysis of how we can do a better program going forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let, let me uh, make a few comments, and uh, I appreciate what has been said. Uh, Councilman Shule's proposal I just got this evening, so I really haven't had a chance to look at it as thoroughly as I would have liked, but I accept the comments that he's made. Uh, first of all, from my perspective, what we're talking about is fairness. We're not talking about what's equitable. We're not talking about what's equal. We're talking about what's fairness. And my wife constantly reminds me that uh, when you're dealing with kids, you love them all, but you can't treat all of them equal because they aren't equal. I mean, what you try to do is to be fair. I mean, you might be giving bicycles. You got four kids, you're giving bicycles to kids. You might decide that you're going to give this type of bicycle to the kid that's 18 years old. If you're going to be equal, you give the same type of bicycle to somebody that's four years old, 12 years old, 13 years old. But you don't do that. You make an adjustment. Then you give a bicycle to the younger kid that has trainers on it. Now, is that bicycle equal to the other one? No, it's not equal. But it's about being fair. And this is what we're talking about, at least what I'm talking about, and this issue we're trying to address about what is fair. Now, my interest in neighborhood revitalization and affordable housing and neighborhood stabilization, it began long before I became mayor in 2001. Uh, it really began when I had an opportunity to take a bus ride with some people who were for affordable housing, Larissa Seibel, she knows the name of the group, when we toured this, this community. And what I saw was quite evident that we needed to do something as a city in terms of trying to help revitalize those neighborhoods that have been depressed for long periods of time. And we needed to find a way to do it to scale, not a house here, a house there, but to do it to scale. And so we took on Barnes Avenue, which is now Eastway Village, 40 plus houses. We didn't push anybody out. It was fair, willing buyer, willing seller. But we transformed that neighborhood. We transformed that neighborhood. And as a result of that, we helped transform a part of Northeast Central Durham. It wasn't everything, but you can't do everything overnight. These neighborhoods didn't get in the positions they're in overnight, and you aren't going to change them overnight. We did the same thing over in Southside with Rolling Hills, formerly Haytai Heritage, Haytai Community, where we just completed 100 plus 40 apartments, mixed income, about to complete another 85. We have home ownership that's going up along that area. And we just didn't do this arbitrarily, as has been expressed. We didn't do it arbitrarily. This council made a conscious effort that just as we were going to support downtown, we were going to support our neighborhoods. And we chose the two neighborhoods we were going to focus on, Northeast Central Durham and the South Side community. It wasn't arbitrary. We looked at where the worst conditions were and what could we do in a skillable way to make a difference. And, and we did that. Now, we are here in August, almost 10 months away, when the South Side community first came to us with this problem in November, and we're still trying to wrestle with it. They came to us because their issue was their property had been assessed, reevaluated, and this is not the city's doing, it's the county's doing. Everybody knows that the county makes the evaluations of all properties across, across the, the, the county and the city. They do it every eight years. Now they're talking about doing it every four years. But the county made the decision that the values of not only their property, my property, every piece of property in here had a certain value on it. That, that, that was a county decision. That didn't cause the taxes to increase. That didn't cause the property tax to increase. What caused the property tax to increase is that the city council and the county commissioners so the tax rate, okay, that caused those properties properties to increase. Now we, we we could have said, okay, we don't if we want the, want the properties to increase, we we'll have a lower tax rate. And we could have done that. And then what would have been the result in terms of how this city is operated, the type of services we we provide? 
It wouldn't have happened. So the valuations themselves didn't cause the problem. The problem is that because of the values, the city and the county set a tax rate that caused the property taxes to be high. This is an effort. And when I say an effort, when the city decided to try to help revitalize those neighborhoods, unfortunately, what we're having is an unintended consequence. An unintended consequence. It wasn't an intention that when we revitalize these neighborhoods, that homeowners, low-income homeowners in particular, were going to have those taxes to the point where it was unbearable. That was an unintended consequence that was done because of the actions that the city council took. And as a result of that, I think we bear a certain obligation to try to mitigate that. And that was the proposal. Now, whether we call it a loan, a grant, or whatever, what we did, and, I, and I'll, I'll come back and take the blame on me because be truthful, what we did is after we heard them, this council said, well, let's, maybe we need to get the county involved because the county raised their taxes also. And we went to the county. And the county said, no, we aren't touching that in all, in all, all effect. Now, I understand what they did. I served on the Board of County Commissions for 26 years. I understand what they were wrestling with. So I'm not faulting them. But the fact is, we're talking about taxes that are price, tax, property taxes that have increased because the city has a tax rate and the county has a tax rate. So if you're going to solve the problem, are you also going to solve the county tax rate? Well, we asked the county to do it. They aren't doing it. So, you know, if we, if we were really saying we're going to deal with our problems only, we'd only talk about the amount of taxes increase that has done, been done because of what the city did. But the staff took this proposal, and they went back and spent time with it. And not only did they say, okay, we bridged the gap between the city tax increase, but also the county tax increase, and we pay for it. That, that was an argument then. This is what they, what they came back with. That, to me, that's fairness. It's not necessarily being equal, but it's fairness. We caused the problem, so we're trying to mitigate the problem. And that was one of the proposals that we had. You know, I've heard talk about uh, circuit breakers, go to the state, to the General Assembly to get something done. Who thinks we're going to get the General Assembly to do anything with a circuit breaker? Nobody on this council thought about it, thinks about it. <laughs> because, we, we know, you know, for me, you deal with what you can control, and that's what we're trying to do. We don't control the General Assembly. We do control the property tax rate that we set. We do control which neighborhoods we're going to choose to invest, invest in. These are things that we control, and this is the guidelines on which we're trying to work when the staff came back with this proposal. At the work session, someone raised the question, in fact, I think it was Councilman Davis, well, are we really being fair? Are we, are, are we treating people equal? What about the people who don't live within this, this particular area? How can we justify that? Well, you know, the administration looked at this, but also our attorney looked at it. And if Shelley is here, I would like you to speak to that point as to what is the legal basis that you've derived at as to why we could target these particular areas for what we're talking about doing and sh share that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Sherry Zan Rosenthal, senior assistant city attorney. Uh, when I met with staff uh, in spring of this year, uh, what I asked them to do uh, and that we then set up jointly was a meeting with the uh, GIS staff and they did an analysis which showed that in each of the target areas that you have designated and have worked in for a number of years, there has been a uh, disproportionate increase in the tax valuations as compared to either the median or the average for the rest of the city. And so at that point, I felt that whichever way the administration and the staff decided to go as far as um, choosing one area versus another, as long as we could have that statistical showing that there had been a disproportionate impact, I felt confident that I would have grounds to defend whatever direction you and the administration uh, decided to pursue. Well, the, the, the point is, thank you. The, the point is, I, I think what the administration has done, they've come back with a program that is physically responsible, that is legally sound, and it's something that this council chooses to do, can do. 
Now, I've heard a lot of talk about putting uh, loans on low-income people. Uh, it's a 0% loan. I've talked about what happens after four years. What happens after four years, if the person still wants to be in the program and they still qualify in terms of income and all the criteria we set, they can continue that. There's no money out of their pocket. It's a 0% loan, a 0% loan, a 0% loan. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And the only way that, that it gets paid back, if it gets paid back at all, because if a person lives in the house forever and they continue to qualify, they don't have to pay it back. It gets paid back if, for whatever reason, they s decide to sell the home. Now, a home tends to be our biggest asset. Tends to be our biggest asset. So if a person decides that, for whatever reason, they want to sell their home because they want to take the advantage of the increase in the property value and they get a higher price, then they've got a lump of money. And all that we said is, that's fine. But since you've also been able to have this tax-free money for a certain period of time, we at least like you to give the city back what it invested in. No more than what we ask. But if, you, if, you, if it's enough, you pay us back. But that's the only, only requirement that they have. So it's a zero percent interest loan. The reason it's four years is because the county is now thinking about reevaluating property every four years rather than every eight years. So the point is, four years from now, if the county does a, a reevaluation and the property value changes, then the tax owner will be entitled to come in on the same circumstances they had, the state where they are, and apply for the loan again. But again, for, for me, it's about fairness. It's physically responsible. It's legally responsible. The other programs that are being proposed, we haven't had any assessment of that. We don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know what kind of burden it's going to be. This council is not going to administer. The people going to administer are the city manager and his staff. You know, so they should be the ones to come back and tell us what is the cost going to be. They've done that on this, this proposal. So if you're talking about doing something different, to me, you've got to have a similar type of evaluation. But why hold up those residents who first came to us with this problem almost 10 months ago to say, we want to look at a much broader program? They aren't mutually exclusive. You could very easily adopt this program that's been proposed and still have the staff go out and do the study that has been proposed and come back and see what it comes up with. But don't penalize those persons who have been waiting, who came to us with this concern 10 months ago, and say, we're going to put it on hold. No, we're going to change it. We're going to call it a grant, which, again, hasn't been vetted by the administration. I don't know if we can give grants like that or not. You're talking about giving grants to Central to Southside. The reason the staff came back with Northeast Central Durham was because it met the same criteria that Southside did. So you're going to give a grant to Southside and forget about the people over in Northeast Central Durham where we've caused these problems and say, oh, well, you got to wait until we do a further study, until we do a countywide study. And another thing about the proposal I saw is that eventually the proposal says we got to go to the county to see if the county would buy into it. You ain't gonna get, that's not going anywhere. The county's already told us that they aren't interested in doing that type of program for a valid reason. And I'm not getting into whether they should do it or not. So again, I, I think we have a valid proposal by the administration. I think the questions that have been raised about alternatives are alternatives that should be vetted by the administration to see if they can come back with something that fits that criteria. But I think we have a program that's sound, sound physically, sound legally, and will work. And it's not something that's going to cause a burden on those property owners who choose to participate. Who choose, and then nobody's forcing them. They might decide they don't want to participate. But if they do, it's not going to cause all these negatives that I've heard spoken about here this evening. So that, that, there are my comments on that. Uh, I would just hope that we take some action on this tonight. I don't care what we do. I, I care what we do, but we need to take some action so we stop leaving these people in limbo who have come to us originally for this program. And I'm not just talking about Southside. I'm also talking about the people over in Northeast Central Durham, which is a targeted area that we had gone into that the staff has recommended be a part of this program. So I, motion? Our motion is in order. Uh, I, I move that we um, 
adopt the plan presented by staff. Second the motion. It's been properly moved and second. Is further discussion on the motion? There's no further discussion. I recognize okay. council. Um, I'd like to ask our city attorney for a question about the rules of procedure. At this point, would it be appropriate to make a substitute motion or to vote on the existing motion and then make a different? Yeah, if council is interested in, if a council member is interested in making a substitute motion now would be a, yeah. a time to do it. Okay, I would like to make a substitute motion that we adopt Councilman Schultz's plan to give grants to Southside homeowners. Now for the, I'm sorry, we have new microphones. Can y'all hear me now? All right, something's wrong with my microphone. How's this one? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to uh, make a substitute motion that we adopt Councilman Schultz's plan to provide grants to the Southside homeowners for the difference between their 2015 and 2016 taxes now and ask staff to continue to develop a comprehensive property tax grant program for the rest of the city. So second to, to the substitute motion. Second. It's been properly moved and second. We're now voting on the substitute motion. Uh, if there are no further questions, Madam Clerk, I would ask if you would open the vote. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're voting on a substitute motion. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Okay. Uh, will you close the vote? It, pa it passes. Something is wrong with my mic. It passes four to three with Mayor Bell voting no, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden voting no, and Council Member Davis voting no. Thank you. Let's move to the next item, please. Uh, item 40. Item 43, the general business agenda, public hearings. Thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, before I begin, I would like to state that all required notification for the, all the planning related public hearing items before you tonight have been uh, performed per state and UDO requirements and are on file. Uh, text Amendment TC 14003 is a set of updated and reorganized standards as detailed within your agenda packet and presented at work session uh, related to the current design district zoning regulations. Uh, design district zoning districts were implemented within downtown tier in 2010 and 9th Street Compact neighborhood tier in 2012 to establish a version of form-based zoning regulations. Staff has reviewed how the design district regulations have functioned by compiling comments received from staff responsible for development review, the development community, and the general public. Uh, based upon this, staff has developed a set of proposed revisions that do not change the fundamentals of the district's intent or regulations, but have added, deleted, or revised standards to better achieve that intent. Staff has utilized focus groups and has met with uh, various other departments, the Parents Commission, Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission, uh, Downtown Durham, Inc., uh, seeking input and comments. Drafts have also been released uh, for public review and comment. We've held public meetings and have also been reviewed by JCCPC in January 2017. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval 14-0 of the text amendment at its April 11th, uh, 2017 meeting. Um, earlier today, staff had met with uh, county commissioners to uh, uh, provide a presentation at their work session, uh, similar to the one that council has received, and the county commissioners directed staff to discuss with council the following three items. The first was to consider removing self-storage facilities as allowed use uh, in the downtown design district. Second was that council consider adding uh, Rigsby Street to the list of streets with ground floor residential use limits uh, within uh, the newly proposed section 16.13D3 uh, ground floor use limitations. And thirdly, uh, explore developing low impact development strategies within right of way, such as rain gardens, enhanced landscaping and such. Um, as for number one, I'll, I'll just kind of briefly discuss those uh, with you. As for number one, JCCPC recommended not removing uh, this use from downtown, but to require ground floor use uh, uses other than self-storage or, or 
a mixed use type strategy, and that has been proposed within this uh, document before you. Uh, this was further revised at Planning Commission to allow a minimal amount of office space related to that use at the ground floor. Um, unless directed otherwise, uh, staff will continue to look at, and we are continuing to look at uses within design districts as we take a look at further uh, station areas and, and implementing design districts in those areas. Uh, for, as for number two, the areas proposed within section 1613D3 were those proposed by DDI and the focus groups, um, but um, uh, staff doesn't see any issue in including Rigsby Street. Uh, that would be extending from Morgan to Gear, and I can discuss number two if you have further questions with that. Um, and then for number three, uh, staff supports considering how new low impact development strategies can be implemented within the streetscape, but it does require a much more analysis and coordination with other departments such as public works and transportation departments, and we have already identified this topic uh, for further uh, discussion when we take a look at adopting design districts in the other uh, station areas. Um, as a reminder, City Council will be required to take two actions uh, for this item tonight. The first will be vote on the appropriate statement of consistency, which is attachment B in your packet. And the second action would be the actual vote on the ordinance itself, which is attachment A, also A1 through A6, also in your agenda packet. Um, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would first ask other questions, comments by members of the council. We recognize Council Moffitt. Yes, could you say a little bit more? I, I didn't quite understand. I don't know whether the shadow with you can hear me, but the if you can uh, say a little bit more about Rigsby. Sure. So what is being proposed in that section that I referenced, and there's a map to it, and if you have your packet open, I can lead you to exactly where we're talking about. Um, if you go to attachment A1, and it's actually the last, very last page on A1, and you'll see a map there, and that's probably the best way to go about it, is that this is an area, you'll see downtown loop is highlighted, and that the Main Street and Foster, kind of Blackwell Street axes are highlighted, and that's where the proposal is to limit um, residential uses on the ground floor, still allowing res residential uses on all the other floors, but to en encourage more active uses on the ground level or street level, um, uh, non-residential, uh, non non-parking also, so commercial activity, office activity. Uh, county commissioners were supportive of that idea, but they also felt that Rigsby Street uh, would be uh, a worthwhile component of this strategy also. They felt that Foster and Rigsby were very much tied together. Um, so they asked us, uh, asked staff to bring that as a proposal to you tonight. Okay. And does staff have, I, I understood your comments about self-storage, mm -hmm. this is if I understood them. What you were saying about self-storage as a use in downtown is that currently the, this proposal now Include, still includes it <coughs> with retail required on the ground floor, but with an allowance for the required office to be on the ground floor. That's correct. Um, it's not removing, prohibiting self-storage. Um, it's adding a limited use standard that would require a, a different primary use on the ground floor with the exception of a, a about 20 by um, 400 okay. square feet of office for that self-storage use on the ground floor. Okay. And, and does staff recommend that approach? That was the, um, for self-storage, well that was the approach that we took based upon what we heard from JCCPC. Um, we did um, broach that approach of prohibiting self-storage uh, completely for downtown and the direction we, we, uh, we thought we received from JCCPC was to not prohibit it but to encourage a more mix of use that self-storage can be an uh, appropriate component for a downtown development. Um, so we went with that strategy. Um, so, but we heard the alternate request from uh, the commissioners today. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Are there other questions by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Stuhl. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, the two excellent suggestions, well, there are three suggestions for the future here. Two I were of particular concern to me. One is the multimodal TIAs and design districts as a, as a, and the other was new kinds of trash and recycling receptacles in design districts. Mm -hmm. How will these things move forward? They're not in this set of changes. So what would be the process for moving them forward? Um, very good question. So for multimodal TIA, we are exploring that now when we're, <laughs> we, th th just for a little background, th those items came up as we were going through these and there's so much of the apple we could bite off at one time without 
bogging down this process whatsoever, taking on the street uh, uh, design uh, uh, cross-section standards um, was enough for even this project. Um, but we felt that um, uh, multimodal TIAs and taking a look at uh, enhanced trash handling uh, management were, were interesting topics that popped up. The multimodal TIA we have on our list to try to work with. Actually, we're, we've been talking with Go Triangle; they're interested in that, and also we have mentioned it with Transportation Department to look into the, uh, that kind of evaluation analysis type packet um, as we move forward with uh, developing the ad any additional standards for the future uh, transit areas. And as a refresher on that, when we take a look at those future transit areas. Um, and I think this was uh, brought up at work session, or at least clarified at work session, I believe. We anticipate around you know, 90 percent of these standards to apply in those, in those areas also, but we understand that when we take a look at those other transit areas, there might be unique instances that pop, that occur that need to be addressed just for those areas, but also uh, instances such as multimodal uh, transit analysis that might be required, that should be maybe applied throughout all the design districts, such as even downtown or 9th Street where it already applied. For trash handling, that was a topic that came up and there's actually, we've been uh, recently working with General Services and I believe General Services is partnering with DDI and if General Services here and needs to correct me, please do so. Um, they are doing a pilot program of doing a little more automated or remote sensing type trash handling so you know when to go pick up the trash instead of having to service it every day and taking a chance on it. And it's going to become more important when you have those public trash facilities in these other areas in terms of util utilization of resources, sending trucks out and manpower out to service those areas. So that's where that came from. I think one won't be too long before we're going to have a a self-driving dumpster that's going to drive <laughs> that, you know, or something. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Um, could you explain the changes mentioned on pages five and six of the memo regarding open space? I wasn't sure I understood what it meant. Uh, item E. I'm sorry, I, my notes don't show me that much. Okay. Uh, Just the new open space requirements? The changes in uh, the uh, open space. Um, Okay, so part of this um, these, this proposal is implementing um, an open space recommendation from the downtown op open space plan that was recently adopted by council, I believe a year or so ago. And uh, within that plan, it recognized that um, th there should be some uh, amount of uh, dedicated open space for larger development sites. And those were identified um, generally around 80,000 square feet of of new development on sites, um, uh, I believe we have it for three and a half acres or more. And that's just being consistent with that policy direction given from uh, that plan. Uh, there are parameters, we've added specific parameters for that open space uh, requirement. Um, and there's even a special use permit option in there that would allow for if there's some innovative design of open space that we're just not thinking of, allow that to be considered. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great change. I think I appreciate it. Um, the height and density changes, how would the changes that you've talked about in this, that you're writing about here in the UDO, um, affect something like the Solus Ninth Street development in relationship to its neighbors to the east across Iredell Street? Are you with me there, Mike? Uh, you know, yes. Okay. So, you know, you have this big development, mm -hmm. apartment mm -hmm. block on, on between Ninth and Iredell. Mm -hmm. And then across Iredell, you have some small houses. Mm -hmm. um, would this, how would this, would this affect that relationship at all? Not substantially, and that development was actually proposed even prior to the design districts. That was done under a development plan, uh -huh. rezoning mixed-use development. Uh -huh. um, so um, I believe that is uh, support one uh, zoning in the compact district, yeah. which has reduced heights and core, um, but um, uh, might not, this might not reduce the heights 
um, much uh, significantly. I don't, can't say for certain, but I can't imagine it's going to okay. drastically change that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that re relationship worries me sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, not just there, but in other places. And, you know, I hope you all will look at that as well um, and that the JCCPC will think about that. Um, and we've, we just recently had, just for your, your benefit, um, meeting on Patterson Place, and we did a, actually a charrette uh, with stakeholders and residents in and around Patterson Place, and you might rec remember getting an email on that or notification on it. <laughs> and we got some really good input on, on location of, or suggested locations of different sub-districts and, and intensities and where that goes. And we plan on doing that in all the station areas, and we're getting a lot of good feedback on that. Right. I mean, I think if I was a person that lived on Iredell Street, and that big building came, I mean, I understand, you know, you're living in a design district and you've got it, and we, we want densification there. We're expecting transit to be there. The neighborhood endorsed it and so forth. But I think if I lived there, I would, I would want some sort of step back in height and, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and we do maintain those step backs. Yeah. Um, there's an initial podium height and the changes don't get rid of any step backs to achieve your ultimate height. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please finish your mail. You're welcome. Are there other comments by members of the council? We have one person that has signed up to speak on this item, uh, Graham Blacknick. Like Hello, uh, Bram Luke 9, 3517 Rosa Sharon Road, Durham. Um, I'd, my purpose of me standing up to speak today is to commend the planning department. I, had talks with them uh, within the past 30 days regarding uh, what would have been an unintended consequence of eliminating uh, single family residential in the support two district, which is often residential neighborhoods, thus requiring only commercial development in some areas that would, um, in some areas that are uh, definitely residential areas, they were uh, very receptive of those concerns, worked diligently, were very responsive and crafted language that allows for residential use in the support two district when it's adjacent to a residential use or zone. So thank you guys. Thank you. Council. Let me ask are there other persons who want to speak on this item this has been a public hearing. Uh, let the record reflect no one else asked to speak. I would require the public hearing to be closed matter of fact before the council. Move the item. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I wanted to echo those comments. The um, planning department um, has been exemplifying itself. I think I use the right term, but they've just been great at reaching out to the community, and incorporating uh, comments from the public, and working hard to bring all the stakeholders to the table. And it's uh, often reflected in the comments we receive here. So I, I very much appreciate that. Um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I heard your motion. Um, there were three items that they raised, um, and I would ask to, I'd be happy to second the motion if we could amend it to, just to say that we, um, at, at this time, that we're um, approving the item with the self-storage um, uh, uh, issues as recommended by the Planning Commission, which is ground floor ground floor retail allowed in the. It's it's what's currently in your. Okay. In your so what about Rigsby Street? What's currently? Rigsby Street in? is not that again. The, the, yeah, those two items were brought up actually just today. So. The oh, county why? I'm sorry. The, the the Board of County right. Commissioners want right. something different right. than the, okay. Right. So uh, then, uh, forget my first item, please. The second item would be that we would. Um, that uh, Rigsby Street would be included in the area that um, where ground floor residential would not be allowed. Um, just that item, actually. So that's accepting. I, I, I accept the, the department's statement that to work on low uh, impact, de low impact um, development in the right of way. Did I have that right? Yes. Um, that that requires more study. Yeah. And that that can come back at a later date. Absolutely. Um, and I think that the Board of County Commissioners, I did include Rigsby in that more, where you want the, the street level more active. I, I think that's a great idea. And um, so I will ask that inclusion. So Madam Mayor. So what, what is the motion we're voting on? The motion would be to approve the item, but um, include, while including Rigsby Street in the area where ground level residential is not allowed. 
And that, that's within section 16.13.D3. And we'll, we'll make that amendment and get it to the clerk's office. Before you even do that motion, we would need to do the statement of consistency first based upon the new way of doing things, so. Oh. Is there something to add to that? Do, so I'll move the consistency statement. Wait. Did you have anything to add to If I, I might add a point of information to, to the modified motion, I'm sorry to do that so late. Uh, Mike mentioned this briefly, our recommendation, and I think this is consistent with what the Board of Commissioners indicated, was Rigsby from Morgan to Gear. There's some uh, city property at the south side of Morgan that we're looking to do parking along, and we, we wouldn't want to create a nonconformity there. Thank you. <coughs> now, uh, certainly, I would incorporate from Morgan to Gear into my statement. I'm saying my statement, but... So, so is the motion now for consistency, is you making that motion? Yes, sir. Someone second that motion? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Passes seven to zero. Okay. And then I, I will move that uh, approval of the item uh, incorporating the recommendation of the Board of County Commissioners to include Rigsby Street from Morgan to Gear. Um, as an area where ground floor residential um, is not allowed. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk. I have a question. Recognize Mayor Pro Tem for a question. Um, they might want to check the spelling of Rigsby. Absolutely. We will. We don't want the wrong street. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Next item is item 44. Consolidated annexation for 4,000 Danube Lane. Good evening, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, Request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, a future land use map amendment, and a zoning map change have been received from Marlene Coulter for a nine and a half acre contiguous parcel located at 4000 Danube Lane. If approved, the annexation of the site will become effective on September 30th, 2017. The applicant has requested an initial zoning designation of planned development residential 10.000 and the site is currently zoned residential suburban 20. Uh, the development plan associated with this request commits to a maximum of 95 residential units in a multifamily setting. Um, the site is designated as low to medium density residential on the future land use map. Um, in order to accommodate the proposed PDR 10 designation, the applicant is requesting to change that designation to medium density residential, which allows a range of six to 12 dwelling units per acre. Um, some key commitments on the development plan include um, the aforementioned 95 residential multifamily units, um, access points to the site, riparian buffers, and a maximum height of 35 feet. Um, public works and water management departments as part of the utility impact analysis determined that the existing city of Durham sewer and water mains have capacity to serve this project and the Budget and Management um, Services Department performed a fiscal impact analysis which determined this request would be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Um, staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and recommends approval and the adoption of a consistency statement. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have at this time. Thank you. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask first of the questions by staff and members of the council. I recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is this working now? Yeah, yes. sounds louder. Okay, great. Um, Jacob, I had a question. I have not seen yet um, a case like this where an applicant has asked, hasn't asked for a, a direct translation of the county zoning. Mm -hmm. um, can you just explain what the options are? I, I thought that they were required to, to um, ask for a direct translation just because I had never seen something else before. Sure, um, yes, yeah, so there's two cases, or two options. You can ask for an exact translation, or if someone submits a formal rezoning petition 
to go along with that, um, as they have done in this case. And so in doing the latter step, then it'll go to, the request will go to the Planning Commission for recommendation before coming to this body. And do they have to go through all the same processes as they would with a typical rezoning? Yes, ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Is that the question? That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions about members of the council? If not, I did, I, yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. May. I didn't, I didn't quite understand Reese. what you said, Jake, and I thought I understood what we were talking about, but now I don't. Um, if we were to approve the measure tonight, did I hear you to say that they would need to, in order to get the rezoning they're asking for tonight, go to the Planning Commission? Um, Jacob Wiggins, the Planning Department. No, my apologies. So they, they've already gone to the Planning Commission okay, for recommendation okay. on the zoning map change. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we're, we're here to do both the annexation, consider the annexation and the rezoning at the same time? Correct. Great. Thank you, yes, sir. Utilities. I recognize Dan Jewell and Kim Griffin to sign up to speak on this item. Each have three minutes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. I am Dan Jewell with Coulter Jewell Thames. Um, I'm here on behalf of my business partner, Ken Coulter, now deceased seven years, and his wife, Marlene Coulter, with me here tonight. She's hard to see. She's small in the corner here. And her son, Martin Coulter, who is an intern landscape architect in our office and has been working on this project with us. Uh, also here is Kim Griffin, as I said. Let me explain why we're here. Ken and Marlene purchased this property over 30 years ago. Ken often related me the story of how he outmaneuvered Gary Hawk in acquiring it as a blocking move. <laughs> Gary wanted to expand Independence Park to the east and eventually extend Ben Franklin Boulevard through the site all the way to Old Oxford Road. Ken, though, had different ideas about that. He wanted to protect Cub Creek, which runs along the eastern side of this property, and the bottomlands from development. Some of you may remember that Ken was one of the original founders of the Triangle Land Conservancy, Triangle Greenways Council, and did the New Hope Creek open space plan back in the 80s. Ken had walked Cub Creek many times and was impressed with the fact that there was an intact riparian corridor from Carver Street all the way to Eno River. Remember, this was in the days before we had riparian buffer and flood development rules, stormwater rules, designated open space on our future land use map, and tree coverage requirements. So Ken was so adamant that this be protected he and Marlene bought the property, and they have sat on it now for 30 years. Marlene is now 80 and has decided it's time to sell the property to help with her and her family's retirement. She has two primary goals. One is to create some value, which, of course, we know that's one of the reasons we're here. And the other is to rezone with a specific development plan that guarantees preservation of the sensitive areas of this site. We had a neighborhood meeting back last spring. Uh, we heard four specific requests from those neighbors that we limit the height of the building to 35 feet, which we have done, that we provide a landscape buffer along the northern side of the property where one was not required, which we have done, that we extend the sidewalk along the frontage of the property, which we have also committed to, and that we provide a bus stop for the children who are waiting for the school bus to wait at, which we are also committing to do. So, uh, on behalf of Marlene, Ken, and the family, we respectfully request that you follow the Planning Commission's recommendation. And I would also like to say that after consultation with Marlene, um, due to the 21 children that the staff report expects we will add to this project, uh, we would commit to an $11,000 contribution to the Durham Public School Systems prior to approval of the site plan, which re represents a little over $500 per school kid. And I will get that exact wording to the, uh, to the planning staff. Thank you. You're welcome. I recognize Kim Griffin. I'm Kim Griffin with Griffin Associates Realtors, 1816 Front Street, Durham. And I first met Ken Coulter in 1977 when I did my first development and he convinced me not to develop the land that went halfway into the Eno River, but to incorporate it so that we would have a trail that goes from Guest Road to Coal Mill Road and that people could walk on it. And so when Marlene wanted me to sell the property, I was naturally very excited about it because he's one of the people that helped me when I first started in real estate. We are basically down to two serious 
potential developers. One, um, both are going to use housing finance agency financing. One is considering senior, the other is considering family, and this site would uh, meet the criteria if it is properly zoned. The big objection we've had is the time that it takes to get property rezoned, and by uh, moving forward with this tonight, I think you will assist affordable housing as well as the Coulter family. So I would appreciate you supporting this. Let me ask, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item, this being a public hearing item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else has to speak. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, Jacob, could you just walk through the sequence of the motions, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, Jacob Wiggins, the Scott. planning department. So there, there are two motions for this item. Um, the first motion contains the utility extension agreement the annexation petition, and the consistency statement. The second item will contain, or I'm sorry, the second motion would contain the future land use map resolution and the zoning ordinance. I still second. <laughs> still, two, still two motions. I'll move the annexation agreement, the utility extension, and the consistency statement. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Vote. I'll move the uh, future land use map changes and the, what else do I need to do? Be the zoning map change. And the zoning map change. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. to the next item, 45. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Pat Young with the planning department. Wanted to briefly introduce you to a new face, uh, new to you at least. Ms. Jamie Sunyak. Uh, Jamie's been with our staff as a senior planner for just over six months, has presented a number of cases to the Planning Commission, but this is her first time before you, and you will be seeing her uh, going forward. Jamie is a very experienced planner. Uh, she's a licensed principal planner in New Jersey, which is where she's from, the only state who licenses planners, uh, and uh, is, has a wealth of experience. It's been a great addition to the staff, so I just want to briefly introduce Jamie and, and turn it over to her for this meeting. Evening. I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. A zoning request has been received from MRDC Brightleaf LLC uh, for approximately 34 acres at 3220 Flat River Drive. The subject site was zoned planned development residential 3.990 by the council on June 4th, 2001. It was case P00-05. The approval involved 678 acres with this track 12 area designated as a school or townhouse. The development plan also committed to the construction of the Northern Durham Parkway from Sharon Road through the Brightleaf track, which has been completed to Flat River Drive. The applicant seeks two amendments. First is the elimination of the commitment to construct a portion of the roadway from Flat River Drive south, but the 120-foot right-of-way dedication will remain. And second, the applicant is proposing 65 single-family units, which requires a zone change from PDR 3.990 to th uh, PDR 1.902. The applicant also seeks a comprehensive plan amendment to change the future land use map designation from low-medium density to low-density residential to coincide with the zoning request. <coughs> Key commitments as shown on the associated development plan include um, site access points, tree preservation areas, project boundary buffers, and uses limited to single family residential development. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this case by a vote of 13 to 1 
at their May 9, 2017 meeting, and staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you again. You've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask other questions, comments by members of the staff. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is there a graphic commitment for the trail easements on the existing site plan? Or I, I wasn't quite sure what the situation was with the trail easement. Uh, the existing conditions map shows a greenway easement through the property. And as also shown on the development plan, um, which is sheet 02, it's also highlighted there. Um, existing 100 foot public greenway easement and it's um, in the southeastern portion of the property. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering in the summary of development plan, this is a 34 acre site. In the summary of development plan it says that 72 percent impervious surface consists of 79 acres and I wondered if this was just a typo. I think it actually may have come from a template that was for maybe the next item or something like that, so you all might want to look at that. Okay, thank you. And those were my two questions for staff, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions, comments? If not, we have two persons that have signed to speak on this item, uh, John Jekko and Patrick Biker. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker, and I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham, and I'm here tonight representing L Star Management, the developer of Brightleaf at the park, for this down zoning from PDR 3.99 down to PDR 1.902. The main issue in this zoning map change is the removal of a developer obligation to build a segment of Northern Durham Parkway. To look into the historical context of this obligation, which stretches back over 20 years, our community back then was embroiled in a controversy about a road called Eno Drive. And Eno Drive eventually transitioned into a project called Northern Durham Parkway. I think Mayor Bell and Council Member Moffat will recall that I had a front row seat for those events. More recently, and I think wisely, our local and state elected leaders saw fit to reallocate all the money from Northern Durham Parkway to the East End Connector. And we see that construction going on today along NC 147 and US 70. I bring this up because it has been my privilege to work on Brightleaf at the Park for many years, initially assisting my former partner, Jack Markham, on this fine neighborhood. In fact, I recall driving former City Council Member Diane Katati through Brightleaf and her remarks that this development was well done with a walkable elementary school as well as great recreational amenities for the residents. Fast forward to August of 2017 and the requirement for Brightleaf at the Park to build a section of Northern Durham Parkway after our public sector leaders have abandoned that project makes no sense. Please keep in mind that all of the right-of-way has been dedicated for Northern Durham Parkway within Brightleaf at the Park but to build a road to nowhere that will inevitably require maintenance dollars from the city of Durham does not represent wise policy. Furthermore, it is important to recognize that Brightleaf at the Park was a failed subdivision and L-Star purchased it out of foreclosure. After that purchase, L-Star invested hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring inadequate streets up to city standards and to address the complaints of new residents so that the city did not have to do that. In closing, since the City of Durham and NCDOT have moved on from Northern Durham Parkway, it is only fair that the same standard apply to this neighborhood. For all these reasons I've discussed, along with the positive staff report, the vote of the Brightleaf homeowners, 180 to 13 in favor of this item, and the 13 to 1 recommendation for approval <coughs> from the Planning Commission, we respectfully ask for your approval of this agenda item. Our team, which includes Adam Ashbaugh from L-Star, Tommy Craven, our lead engineer from Priest Craven, is here to answer any questions you may have or to provide you with further background on this item. We thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. 
John Jekyll. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and honored uh, council members. Thank you for hearing my voice. My name is Sean Jekko. I live at 1705 Creighton Hall Way, which is in the Brightleaf community. My family and I have lived in that subdivision since 2010. As you know, LSTAR and MREC Brightleaf are petitioning to make changes to an agreement penned with the city in 2001 in the case P00-05, and I'd like to provide an alternative point of view on the matter. Uh, there seem to be several issues at play in the request, but I'd like to focus on two. Should the next portion of Northern Durham Parkway be built, and who should pay for it? LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf seem to be making the following argument. Currently, Northern Durham Parkway is a road to nowhere. Extending this road could create a hot spot for crime. Therefore, LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf shouldn't have to pay for the road extension. LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf have also submitted evidence to suggest that the residents are in support of this rezoning request. That was actually at the Planning Commission meeting. However, the two entities seem to have been less than forthright with their evidence. In a presentation to the Durham Planning Commission on May 9th, 2017, Mr. Tommy Craven of Priest Craven & Associates and Brooke White of LSTAR MREC Brightleaf submitted a letter purportedly from the community HOA endorsing LSTAR MREC's position. I have a copy of that letter if you'd like to review it. There's at least one problem with this letter. The letter lists members of the Brightleaf Neighborhood Watch Committee in a way that suggests their endorsement of the land use change. But at least two of those people, Felisa Scott and Delethea Lloyd, and possibly all of them listed on the letter had no idea such a letter existed or that their names were being used to endorse its contents. But back to the two issues at hand. Should the road be built? Possibly. I'm not versed enough on the topic of road construction and crime, and I defer to the, to the experts on that matter. Should LSTAR or MREC Brightleaf pay for it? The fact of the matter is that the road is in the comprehensive plan for Durham and it will become a reality one day. And that means someone will have to pay for the next phase of Northern Durham Parkway. Either LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf, or the citizens of Durham. I'd urge the council to carefully consider the rezoning request being made. This is not a question of safety, as LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf would have you believe, but a question of fiscal responsibility. As it stands, <coughs> the expansion of the road is funded. However, if LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf is released from fiscal responsibility, then the city will have to find funding elsewhere, possibly diverting funds from other NC DOT projects or through tax increases, neither of which seem like attractive options to Durham's residents. If LSTAR, MREC, Brightleaf wants to live into the motto posted on their website, do the right thing and do it with passion, then I suggest the company place the full dollar amount of the Northern Durham Parkway extension in an escrow account so the extension can be fully funded when the time is right. That, Mr. Mayor and honored council members, is doing the right thing. Thank you for your time and thank you for considering this alternate point of view. You're welcome. Are there other persons that want to speak on this item before I come back to the council? I'll let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak on this item. I recognize the planner. Yes, um, just for point of clarification, I, I wanted to correct the typo that was in attachment seven, summary of development plan, it should be 29.1% or 10 acres of impervious coverage. Is, is anyone on the staff to speak to the road issue? Council judges. Yeah. Are there some questions? The question is whether it's funded or not funded. Yes, Bill Judge with the City of Durham Department of Transportation. The, uh, the road is in our adopted uh, Metropolitan Transportation Plan as well as the Comprehensive Transportation Plan, but it is currently not funded. We would anticipate that it would be constructed uh, through the state TIP funding uh, project, the, the remainder of the road, and thus far it's, it's not currently funded. Okay. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Mr. Biker, Attorney Biker mentioned uh, uh, two very dangerous words, uh, Eno Drive. Tell me about how that correlates with Northern Durham Parkway. That's a great question, Mayor Pro Tem, and I could take three hours instead of three minutes to answer that question. It was a, uh, 
I believe Nick Tennyson described it as a, uh, a toxic project, if I recall. That's um, probably and yeah. working with uh, Council Member Moffitt back when he was involved with the Eno River Association, numerous community leaders, great people like Wayne Cash and um, Donna Deal, we worked out a compromise called Northern Durham Parkway. However, I did talk to former mayor, former NCDOT Secretary Nick Tennyson to ask the question that Bill Judge just answered. I wanted to confirm my understanding that all of the money that at one point in time had been reserved for Eno Drive and then Northern Durham Parkway was in fact allocated completely to the East End Connector. Okay. And we all see that project every day on US 70 and at 147. It's a huge project. It took all that money. Accordingly, it's many years, I would say decades, until there's any funding available based on my experience with state transportation funding. So I welcome that question. I certainly don't mean to belabor the point, but uh, there is no funding for that project, and we as a community have moved beyond it. I think that's a fair statement. I know the Eno Drive is definitely there. That's the one we oppose. Yeah. Well, I, I recall one of the first things that I did when I became mayor was to convene both proponents, opponents, members of the chamber, business community, uh, in the committee room to specifically talk about an alternative, and that's where Eastway Expressway uh, got its genesis. But having said that, we're back on the point now. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter's back before the council. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I recognize Councilor Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have another question. Is that okay? Sure. Um, I'm still not clear about, maybe, Mr. Judge, you can maybe help me a little bit. So um, it's in the it's in the transportation it's in the uh, metropolitan. Tell me which plans it's in again. It is in the uh, comprehensive transportation plan, which is the and the metropolitan transportation plan. But it is not currently in the um, funded state TIP. Okay. Have we have we applied for any funding through the state TIP for this road? Um, it is. Uh, on the project list that we're considering for the next round of uh, spot 5.0 submittals. Okay. Um, some of the indication I've gotten preliminarily is it doesn't look like it's scoring very well, but um, that'll be a determination that the, that the MPO board will have to make whether to, to submit that project forward for consideration in, in spot 5.0. Okay. Uh, in, in this round of spot 5.0? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and thank you. And then um, I'm not sure who can tell me this, but how many feet? Of, and may I may have this is probably in the memo, and I missed it. And I apologize. Um, how many f uh, the the length of this road that uh, the developer was committed to build and would not be building? And Patrick, you may know that as well as. Um, My name is Tommy Craven with Priest Craven and Associates. The, the length of the road from Flat River to the property line that would not be built is approximately 900 feet or so. 900 feet. So a fifth of, less than a, less than a fifth of a mile. Yes. Okay. Um, however, all the right of way is, has been dedicated. And would be continued at, at 120 feet wide. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I, I want to start by thanking the citizen that came to speak and raise the issues. Um, and put the it, the issue about uh, letters that might have been submitted to the planning commission. I haven't seen those, and um, the people that you spoke of as having not been signatories are not here tonight. Um, and I, I don't really know how to address that, but I really want to appreciate you for coming and bringing that forward. Um, I wanted to talk for a moment um, so that the Northern Durham Parkway is, a, is, there is, it is a key component in the resolution to uh, the Eno Drive conundrum that we had. There were seven components. Um, the largest and most expensive one was the East End Connector, and Caleb Southern actually wasn't been mentioned tonight, was the one who really pushed this um, the, the total compromise package. So 
um, eventually Northern Durham Parkway will build. It's a, will be built. Um, it is an important connector that uh, should connect from, I think it starts at 70, but it may go south of there, but goes all the way up to, um, uh, crosses the Eno at Old Oxford and connects into 501 so that eventually people coming south uh, in, into Durham and headed uh, towards Raleigh, towards the airport, will not have to actually drive through downtown Durham in order to do that. And um, we will like that when it finally happens. Um, that being said, um, the case tonight is, uh, to, it, we can either vote it up or vote it down, but um, it changes the overall density of the project, down zones it to a, a much lower density. And then the second aspect of it is this aspect of whether or not the paving should be done or at least paid for. And um, I, I accept the arguments. I look at the site. It's a very complex site to develop. And I accept the argument that it, um, that with the, all of the different easements on it and the, and, and the topographic issues that it, that the lower density is appropriate. Um, I have lived in the country here in North Carolina. I have seen paved roads where there were no residential along it. And I have seen that they, uh, people tend to like to drive their cars there, hang out late. And um, typically, the ones that I've seen were very trashed. So I can imagine if I lived in this community, I, I would not want a piece of road that was to be unused to be paved and left sitting there. Um, uh, the developer, when they acquired the property, did acquire it with this requirement on it, but with the higher density. So I guess the question could be raised is whether or not with the lower density they should be expected or could be expected to um, come up with the, the funds required to do all of the things that they've committed to, com that were committed previously, the commitments that came with the property. And I would I am comfortable that with the lower density that the, that the most appropriate thing to do is to ex as for them to dedicate the property but not pave the road. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there other comments? Thank you, Councilman Moffitt. If not, the public hearing is closed. Um, uh, entertain a motion on the item. Uh, Getting the consistency statement first. Jamie Sunyak, Planning Department. You would vote first on the land use designation, um, and that would be for low, um, to change it from low medium residential to low density residential, then the consistency statement, and then the uh, zoning designation. So um, I, I will move, I think I have this correct, I will move to uh, accept the staff's recommendation, to approve the staff's recommendation for changes to the comprehensive plan. Second. Is that all he has to do? Okay. It's properly moved to second. Any questions? If not, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. And now I will move. Seven oh, zero. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll now move the consistency statement. Property moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. It's past just, it. I'm sorry, it's just at 70. It's, it's the, the second vote, the second motion is the consistency statement and the zoning together combined in one. I only made the one motion, so I'll make another motion now, which is simply to accept the staff's recommendation right. for, the, for the new use zone. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. Moved item 46, zoning map change for Carillion Assisted Living of North Durham. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak again with the Planning Department. A zoning map change request has been received from 
Tony M. Tate Landscape Architecture for 14.34 acres at 4112 and 4214 Guest Road. The subject site is zoned Residential Suburban 20. The applicant requests to change this designation to Planned Development Residential 3.906 in order to construct a 56-room congregate care facility. There are no changes to the future land use designation. Key commitments as shown on the associated development plan include site access points, building and parking envelopes, tree preservation areas, project boundary buffers, and uh, design commitments for the building. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this case by a vote of 14 to 0 at their April 11th meeting and the staff recommends that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. The staff report has been made. Public hearing is open. Other questions first by members of the council? Here are none. I want to recognize Robert Stinson and Pamela Porter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hearing from us this evening. Uh, my name is Robert Steenson, uh, 4901 Waters Edge Drive, Raleigh. Uh, I'm with Carolina Assisted Living. I am, I'm here to speak uh, in, in favor of the project, of course. Uh, very briefly, because it's getting later, uh, Carolan, uh, for those of you who don't know us, is a local North Carolina company. Uh, we provide uh, assisted living and, and Alzheimer's services through 21 licensed facilities uh, in North Carolina. A uh, Carillon facility uh, is a residence for the frail elderly. The typical resident uh, is an individual in their 80s who needs some help with uh, activities of daily living. <coughs> uh, we also provide uh, secure care for those suffering from uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, or other forms of dementia. Uh, we, are, we are not a medical facility. Um, Carillon uh, is not a developer in the traditional sense. Uh, we, are, we are owners, and so when we, we come to a community, uh, we stay. We still operate uh, every building that we've developed since we were founded in 1996. Um, we also try to serve the needs of the entire community, um, as unlike uh, many new assisted living facilities, uh, Carillon accepts the, the state assistance and uh, Medicaid programs for low-income seniors. Uh, there is a strong need for additional assisted living services uh, in the northern part of Durham. Uh, if you took the five-mile ring around uh, the site, there are today 5,782 seniors age 75 and older. That population is projected to grow over the next five years by 20% to just under 7,000 seniors. Um, at present, in that same circle, there are only 296 licensed beds to serve that population, and only 20 of those beds are dedicated to the care for those suffering from Alzheimer's. The Carillon Project will add up to 84 beds, and up to 48 of those can be dedicated to caring for those with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have been looking for five years for a suitable location uh, in this part of town, and we think we have finally found an excellent one. Um, as noted, the Planning Commission gave us a unanimous approval. Uh, we also, uh, while it's not required by the ordinance, we did hold a neighborhood meeting on July 11th um, to meet our new neighbors and answer any questions that, that they may have had. Um, uh, we had the unanimous support of those in the neighborhood as well. So uh, we, uh, we respectfully request your support, and I am, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pamela Porter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Pam Porter, 5714 Williamsburg Way. I work for Tony Tate Landscape Architecture. I'm the landscape architect on this project, and I'll be happy to answer any technical questions you might have on the plans. We did the development plan for this. Thank you. Are there questions of the developer by members of the council? Is there anyone else in the audience that wants to speak on this item? This will be in a public hearing. Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asks to speak. The public hearing is closed. Madam Speaker, for the council. Move the item. Oh. Second. What do you need? Do you need a consistent statement? Yes, I get Jamie Sonyak, Planning <laughs> Department. The first motion would be the, um, the consistency statement. I move the consistency statement. Second. It's been properly moved and second, Madam Clerk. Will you open the vote? We close the vote.
It passes seven to zero. And, and the second item would be the zoning map change. So moved. Second. Been proper to move and second. And Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Move to item <laughs> item forty seven. Um, zoning map change for Andrews Chapel. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. A zoning map change request has been received from Jared Jeremy Midland, Land Development, MI Homes of Raleigh LLC for 114.17 acres located on the south side of Andrews Chapel Road, east of Del Webb, Arbor's Drive. Drive. <clears throat> the subject site was zoned Plan Development Residential 4.793, approved by Council on June 1st, 2015, for residential development with up to 500 units. The applicant is requesting two changes from that plan. First, they are seeking to enlarge the building and parking envelope for the townhouse component, component. And the second, they are seeking an increase in the number of townhome units. No other changes are proposed. The zoning district is consistent with the low medium density residential future land use designation. <clears throat> and there's no change to the recreation open space future land use designation. The planning commission recommended approval of this case uh, 14 to 0 at their April 11th, 2017 meeting, and staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Are there questions by members of the council to the public hearing? If not, uh, we have Chris Mill. Mill. Good evening, Chris Mayle with Eden's Land, a civil engineer and project manager for this project. Um, we're at 2314 South Miami Boulevard in Durham. Um, don't have a lot to add what, what Jamie said. This was mainly, uh, the change is mainly to provide a lar larger envelope for townhomes on the pr proposed development site and an increase in the proportion of townhomes to single family. Uh, Jeremy Medlin from MI is also here tonight we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Are there questions of the developer about council? I didn't have a, I didn't recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I didn't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for your accommodation um, in the outlet on Andrews Chapel Road. That was, uh, that was a big deal for the folks that live near there, um, and I appreciate your willingness to do that. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Let the record reflect no one else has to speak. The public hearing is closed. Matters back before council. I'll move the consistency statement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I'll move the ordinance amending the unified development ordinance. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, we'll move now to the items that have been pulled. Item 12, city code amendment. Uh, Mr. Minister Zaid, this is item 12. City Code Amendment, Sunday morning, alcoholic beverage sales. You have three minutes. Thank you all. Thank you, Council Member, for this privilege. Uh, very briefly on item 12, I want to say something before I said it. Uh, Councilman Julian Johnson and Councilman Steve Shule, we really appreciate your presence at the uh, commemorations and memorial services for Brother Umar. You showed us something as councilman and councilwoman, your concern in our community. I was there too. Thank you, I'm sorry. I, I was you. there also. I missed you. 
I mean, just because <laughs> you, you raised the question, Rick. Um, we all heard about this solar eclipse that is in the process of August the 21st. I'm concerned about the conspiracy of silence here in Durham in the religious community regarding item number 12. I know it's campaign time and it's not an issue to be brought up. Alcohol in the community on Sunday morning. There's no Sunday school. Children riding down Main Street seeing people drinking and sometimes maybe be partying on a Sunday morning. Have we given up on a religious holiday? Have we given up on a religious day, Sunday morning? Or how are we in this conspiracy of silence? We already have concealed weapons with no permits, mixed with alcohol on a Sunday morning. We got a blood eclipse in Durham. Crime is increasing as blood is on the street. Mr. Thomas Bonsfield, you made a statement on August the 5th, and it was reported in the Virginia Pilot. That's in my hometown, Virginia. Also in the Herald Sun, you stated that there's no mind, there's no program that we can come up with that can deal with the mindset of the violence in these conditions that is going on in Durham. And I agree with you 100%. And like a little damage in my conclusion, about 45 seconds, I come to bring you the handwriting on the wall. I understand, Mayor, Mayor uh, Bell, you can't do everything overnight. But this ordinance that you have already passed, it happened overnight because of money, tax revenue. The hell with the church on Sunday and what people think. We're going to do what we want to do. Now I'm saying the blood is going to continue on the street. As long as you renounce your moral character, your civil obligation as a civilized individual, you will continue to see blood in the street and Durham. And in my conclusion, I would like to say this. Those of you who have said I am by in silence and seen them pass this audit, the blood is on your hands. We have the item before us. Uh, I would entertain a motion on the item. I'll move the item. I move second. Possibly move and second. It's for discussion. I want to find out from Mr. Baker what does this ordinance really do? I, I thought I could get Mimosa in a second. Sorry, what, what, what's the explain what that bill does? The, the bill basically, uh, these ABC establishments, and I'm sorry, okay. the, these AB, the ABC yeah. establishments are. No, the mayor, you're right. The mayor, you're right. You're over there. There you go. The mayor, great. The mayor's <laughs> microphone works better. Um, so for the um, establishments, ABC establishments can start to sell alcohol at 12 on um, on Sundays, as the law currently. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, <laughs> as, as the law was, but the law, rec as recently amended, allows localities to amend that to uh, to bring it down to 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so all retail establishments, restaurants, uh, should you pass this ordinance, they can start to sell alcohol at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sundays. Okay. That's the extent of the ordinance. Yeah. I just want to address um, my friend, um, a pastor in Durham, um, gave me his opinion, and I, I don't know if that's based on all the pastors, but uh, he encouraged us. Um, he encouraged me to vote for it. Well, at 10 o'clock, most of the people that I know are in church anyway, and I would like to think that they're not going to stay out of church just to go get a drink. I should hope not, um, but I certainly understand what you're saying. Thank you. Second. It was. Uh, it's an approximate move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. 
It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll now move to item 31. Item 31 reads, recommendation for completion of stormwater infrastructure in Ravenstone, the Stonehill Estates subdivision. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I pulled this item, it's a public works item. I see Mr. Joyner coming to the microphone. Um, the staff has uh, put together a, uh, so uh, they brought this item to council a couple years ago in 2015, I believe. Um, well, they've actually been to us several times. It has a long history. Um, and they've done an admirable job of trying to follow staff, uh, excuse me, <coughs> council's directives and really work with the people in the community. So I, I asked this to be pulled, and I think you have a number of speakers as well. Is that right? Okay, so I'll wait, I'm sorry, I'll stop and let the speaker speak and then start again. But I do have a proposal to change the way that we do assessments here. We have seven people, persons that have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, I'll call your name, you can go to the podium to the right. Uh, Lindsay Hedge, the person. Uh, Joetta McMiller, Millen. Michael Kerr, Cam, Kerke. James O. Williams. It says Charlene C. <coughs> Keith <coughs> Davis. And John McLean. Now, is there anyone else that wanted to speak who has not signed up or whose name I did not call? Okay, if you proceed, just state your name and address again, please, and you have three minutes each. Mayor Bell, members of the council, my name is Joetta McMiller, and I live at 113 English Ivy Drive in Ravenstone. And uh, I would like to just, uh, I wasn't planning on, well, we're not on camera anymore, so this isn't going to be as embarrassing. But uh, one of the things that has been uh, talked about is the assessment to the homeowners. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is when I bought my home, my husband and I bought our home in uh, May 28th of 2008. Um, we were both living a different, uh, more comfortable life at that time uh, through several um, job changes, losing of jobs. Uh, we've gone anywhere from making $40,000 a year to $20,000 a year less. Uh, right now, to avoid losing our home, we are in bankruptcy, and we are working through being able to save our house. So um, any kind of assessment at this time being due to the fact that the trustees take the majority of our money from our check because we had to tell them what our expenses were versus what we were making. Um, we really don't have any extra money left at the end of our paycheck to be paying any additional fees for something that um, wasn't necessarily our fault to begin with. So that's all I really have to say. And, you know, I just appreciate you um, thinking about this and, and the assessments that are going to come forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening to the council. Mayor Bell, good to see you again. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Paul McFadden, good to see you again. Um, unlike most of the folks could, that... Could, could you state your name just... I'm sorry, thank you. Michael Kirkew, I'm the HOA president for Ravenstone. I live at 221 Hillview Drive. Unlike most of the folks who come to talk to you, um, we're not asking for help in Ravenstone. You need to be clear, Durham is asking for Ravenstone and Stonehill Estates help. I'd like to share with you that our community, as of this morning, it has a 35.6% a delinquency rate uh, on HOA dues alone. This number indicates that a large percentage of our families are still living paycheck to paycheck. The additional more than $2,000 bill for the city's errors is not insignificant. What we are faced with is not how to share in paying a bill <clears throat> that the city has incurred, 
it would not be proper to seek a fair and equitable solution to this problem, which shares the penalty for the city's mistakes 50-50. What we face here is what is right and what is wrong. The city ordered the developer to write the specific verbiage in the bonds and to pull out enough in bonds to cover any potential failure. The developer did as the city instructed. There were sufficient bonds to cover 100% of the work after the failure. However, the verbiage the city required ultimately meant that the insurer was not required to pay on the bonds. Since the case began due to the city's willful neglect, they literally instructed the DPW not to work in our neighborhood because it would bring the appearance of an implicit accountability and responsibility. The costs approximately tripled. Still, with services not rendered to our citizens, we have paid more than $9 million in city taxes. But none of the buses we paid into come into our neighborhoods. No city parks were built anywhere near our community and the American Tobacco Trail is still too crime-ridden for our residents to safely use. Now there's a new train coming to town, nowhere near our uh, residents. Most importantly, until this summer, our streets were treacherous to travel on, and our drains would not function until there was at least two inches of rain in the streets. I ask that tonight you don't consider how easy the bill for you or for me might be to pay. I'm confident you all have wine bottles or heirlooms that exceed the price tag of this water retention project. The only entity at fault in this debacle has been those in our elected and employed government. As the judge ultimately stated, the city is solely responsible for the failure. I ask that you do what is right, not what is easiest. I ask that the city of Durham pay the bill so we can all move on. Thank you. Council. My name is Lindsay Heggie. Um, my husband and children and I live at 312 Rondelay Drive in Ravenstone. We just moved to this neighborhood last year. Um, when we moved, we were given some information that said that there was a kind of pending, I don't even think the word, word was lawsuit, that there were some possible charges that could be incurred to us. Um, that we were given the information, we looked through them, and by reading what we could find, it seemed like obviously there had been um, some disagreement Clearly it would be worked out in the sense that if there were city roads that needed work done on them, we pay city taxes, they would be covered. That's part of why we pay city taxes. My husband and I have lived in Durham um, since 2010. We chose to move to this area because we have a special needs daughter and she needs to be closer to the public schools that have the special needs programs. Where we lived in South Durham because of the way that the school system functions, because of the socioeconomic climate of South Durham, they don't have the Title I pre-K programs that our special need daughter needs. And we choose to keep her involved in public school because we think it's important for her to have the same opportunities as some other children might have in different kinds of uh, private education that she's not able to get. And so we chose to continue to stay in Durham County and Durham City because of that. We could just move over a couple streets and we'd be in Wake County where the schools um, could be argued better. They could have different things for our child. Um, but we love Durham. We have a child, an older child who goes to school at a charter school in downtown Durham because we want her to be involved in a community that um, supports socioeconomic diversity, that she gets to come home and tell us about working in their garden plots at their school so that they can share them with their neighbors that are homebound in different parts of downtown Durham. This is part of the reason that we live in Durham, because we love it here. So to us, to now be told that the city taxes that we pay, pay as city residents, um, the reason that we continue to live in Durham, the things that we love about it, are now going to incur us additional costs that have never been a part of, from my understanding, um, any charges that have ever been brought to specific residents of a neighborhood that again, from my understanding of this, and I'm new to this, I understand, I've only been here for about a year, that any time that there has been um, a, uh, an issue with a bankruptcy from a developer, that the residents themselves haven't been asked to incur these same costs that we are being asked to incur. And I, I'm left to wonder why, why now, why this neighborhood are we being asked to cover these costs that from all of my understanding are something that should be the city's responsibility, um, that we as city residents who pay our taxes um, should be able to have safe streets for our children to play in, should be able to have safe streets 
for our cars to drive on and not be injured, um, not have their bottoms drug out from them from large potholes, um, not be concerned about buildup of rainwater. Um, I would just ask that you consider for our families that choose to live in Durham because we love it, um, that we now not be um, penalized for that same choice. Greetings to the mayor, greetings to the city council members. My name is Keith Davis. I live at 108 Grandamere Court. Uh, I've been living in Ravenstone for about two years now, and I'm a disabled vet. I'm on a fixed income. So mostly when everybody else get their raises and money, I'm fixed from year to year to year unless I get a COLA raise from the government. That usually doesn't happen, but every three, four years, as you'll probably know. So this assessment, when I got, when I bought my house, it was the streets that was an issue. So my team of uh, real estate agent and my lawyer actually had it where the last homeowner has to pay for the streets in my area. So that means I have to still keep in contact with my previous owner so when their bill finally does come through, I can try to get them to pay some of the up to whatever point, up to $500, which would be agreed upon. Anything extra is on me. Now we have the storm drain situation that's coming up now. It's really hard for me to afford, with my medical care going back and forth to the doctors, having surgery, to actually come up with more money to sit and, and try to pay this extra bill, which is unforeseen. Um, also, the fact that, the, um, again, from my understanding, that no other community except for Ravenstone and Stonehenge has had this assessment put on them out of, I believe, 52 communities. So that, that's, I mean, it's a little daunting. It's like, if there's a reason why, I would like to know what the reason why is. Because this money coming out, um, like we said, I'm on the board as well. And I do see a drop in HOA due fees, and we have to cover all of this. So that means people are not moving into the area. People are not paying the HOA dues. So that becomes a major problem when this should have been taken care of. The community was built in 2005. There was a bond issue that was, which was rendered. And the city lost that due to how the bond was written for the developer. The developer went bankrupt, went belly up. That is not the, the resident's fault. The residents should rely on the city to protect us and for litigation such as that. That's why we have the city. That's why everybody comes out, the state inspectors, everybody comes out to look at uh, the water, the sidewalks, and the sewers and all that to make sure we are protected. Thank you. Um, hello, Maribel. My name is Jonathan McLean. I live at 12 Red Sage Court within Ravenstone. Um, amongst echoing what all of my neighbors have already said, you know, 10 years plus of neglect, um, lack of public services such as plowing in our neighborhood for when, um, you know, weather does come in and, and cause issues with our bus routes and all of that. You know, it was, it was spoken about earlier, earlier today about fair versus equal. And I think that's what this comes down to really today is that what happened in Ravenstone, it's unfortunate. It is. But right now, we're asking the residents, our neighbors, to foot 50% of that bill. Well, that's equal when you think about it, right? 50% from, from our local government, 50% from our neighborhood, neighbors. Um, but it's not fair, right? And so I've already heard some, some motions being passed on what's fair what's, what's versus being equal. I just want to make that note. Because you know, I'm I'm a new father of a nine-month-old. I you know I'm I unfortunately budgeted poorly when it comes to diapers, formula, um, you know, baby visits. You know, these things were a big old kick in the uh, budget for me. And I'm not saying you know I'm gonna be bankrupt. And, and unfortunately, as some of our residents are, I I have the I'm fortunate enough to be able to pay these. However, it's gonna hurt. You know, my wife and I, we don't get much time to go out anymore. Um, that's because of time as well as financial constraints. Uh, my student loans are still hammering on me and they will be for the next six years. Um, you know, I'm paying around $1,200 a month in just that alone. Um, but, you know, adding this on top of it, it I mean, let, let's break it down, $750 to me is, is six months of baby formula. It could be eight months of um, baby diapers, 
It's also a year's worth of my wife and I going out on dates, let's say like once a month, and we spend like you know, 60, 70 bucks, we go grab dinner and a movie. That's gone. Um, now granted, we might try and stretch that out across the years, but I mean the total is the same. So I wanted to just go ahead and sum up there that you know, it's unfortunate what's happened, and you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a conversation of equal, it's a conversation of fair and it shouldn't be placed onto the neighbors or our, the residents of Ravenstone community. Thank you. James Williams. He had to leave, his wife is not well. Okay, Charlene C. Is anyone else that wants to speak that hasn't spoken, didn't sign up? If not, uh, we're gonna bring this back to the Council, and uh, I'm going to. I have some comments I'm going to make on American as uh, Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to ask uh, two questions of staff, just based on the comments that we heard. Um, Mr. Baker, um, we heard one of the speakers say that uh, that the problem with the bonds was specific language that the developer was instructed to include by the city, um, and I wanted to just ask you if you concur with that. Um, I'd ask Don O'Toole, who actually was a was was a litigant in there. Well, uh, one of the attorneys that was litigating the case. Um, I let him start, and and I may add to that. Don O'Toole, city attorney's office. That is correct. The language on the bonds is language that was provided by the city. Okay, and it, that language was also at issue in the declaratory judgment case. Okay. The second question I have for you, just um, sure. the, the statement was that the judge in his uh, and his findings said that it was solely, that this problem was solely the responsibility of the city. That's not accurate. Okay. Um, the, the, the case was solely interpreting the language in the bonds. And um, uh, as I've told counsel before, that was one federal judge's interpretation. Um, I believe the city had a very strong argument that the bonds actually covered more of the unfinished work than what the judge found, but the judge didn't agree with the city's argument. We had an expert in the construction industry that testified through affidavits what the language in the bonds meant to him as a professional engineer, as a developer, and he completely agreed with what the city said. Right. So okay. it, it came down completely to bonds that the city had used for decades and the way a judge interpreted it. The, the, We've since changed the bond. Thank language. you. There, there's many, many issues at play. These were just two that were raised. Um, Mr. Joyner, I have a question for you. Um, I heard the comment made that no other, there's been no other failed subdivision, I'll use that term, it wasn't what was used, but I'm paraphrasing, where people have had to pay for um, any improvements. Um, and I know that the staff has worked really hard for, to, to to find developers to come in to use bond proceeds and whatever assets remain in a failed subdivision to get it worked out so that doesn't happen. But my, my recollection is there's been at least one where there was an assessment which was a lower dollar amount but a much higher percentage than what we're talking about here. Is my recollection anywhere close to accurate? Your recollection is correct. Uh, Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Uh, so the subdivision in question was by the name of Dunwoody. It was a 12-lot subdivision. Uh, they did not have enough securities to complete the street. There was a street-only assessment uh, for that project, uh, and it was uh, a little over $300 okay. per house. So, um, the, so uh, Mr. Wibke, thank you for being here. It's actually a stormwater case, but this is, a, as we can tell, it's a much bigger issue. You don't have to get up. It's not a, I'm not going to ask you a question right now. Um, but, I'm, but that's why I'm, I'm turning to Mr. Joyner, because he's shepherded through the earlier part of the case with us. And so, but thank you for being here. Um, the, the, in 2015, that's when council considered the first ordering the paving, is that correct? Uh, the pavement was ordered actually earlier than that. Uh, we went through, uh, excuse me, you're correct. Two, 2015 was the year it was ordered. Right. So in 2015, we, 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 we took our first, first of all, I feel your pain. Let me just say that. It's been a long time. When I first joined council, I went to my first coffee with council over in PAC 1, 
and there was a whole presentation there about these issues, and, um, and, they're, and they're still going on. So I, I absolutely feel your pain. And um, the, the, we struggled with, I, I completely understand the perspective, this, hey, the city should, it's all the city's responsibility. I also understand the perspective that this is the homeowner's responsibility, what can the city do to help? That's not your perspective, I totally get it. Um, so, um, where we are is that we started out, the council in 2015, which did include all the people up on the dais today, that, that council said, it did include me, 50-50. And that was on paving. But that wasn't final, but that was our sort of initial. And so based on that, the staff has brought forward now stormwater on the same, well, uh, looking for guidance from the council. And in looking at this, I've really struggled to, to wrap my head around all of the issues and to go, well, what's, what's really equitable here? Um, there's, we have, in, in these two subdivisions, and they're lumped together, I assume, because it's the same developer. Is that right? Uh, so they were lumped together uh, because it's the same developer, and the uh, lawsuits that went forth were between two insurance companies that were present in both Okay. Subdivisions. So they're sort of linked together. And in these two subdivisions, there's, uh, as I understand it, there's three separate cases. In Ravenstone, there's 85 lots which have finished streets but unfinished stormwater. In Ravenstone, there's 221 additional lots that have unfinished streets and unfinished stormwater. And in Stonehill Estates, 187 lots with unfinished streets and unfinished stormwater. So if I'm a home, if I'm a home buyer, and I go out to these, one of these subdivisions and I pick out a lot. And I think, and I, to me, I reasonably, I think it's, I don't have an, I don't question the reasonableness of thinking, hey, the streets aren't done yet, but they're gonna get done and I'm gonna buy a home and my money is gonna help pay for these streets. It didn't happen. Stormwater is even a little harder because streets right out in front of the, right out in front, the stormwater facility might be two blocks away. And, um, so depending on where I bought my lot, based on the 50-50 split on, for both stormwater and uh, paving, I might be assessed over $3,000 or over $2,200 or just under $300. And it seems sort of random to me. So, I, and I, so I, what I've done, I worked on this, thought about this, and I said, well, I want to do, I think, I can't get to zero. I'm sorry, I can't get to zero. What I got to was, is that um, the 85 lots, I did a little rounding here, but the 85 lots that have stormwater only, I said, for, well, excuse me, for every lot that has stormwater, uh, where a stormwater facility has to be repaired, that we would, in my proposal, we would assess every home $300. And for every lot that has paving that has to be repaired, we would assess $1,200. That comes up to a total uh, of um, $637,000. So that you don't care about. What you care about is $1,200 and $300. The city cost climbs to a million and a half dollars. That would be our share. It would be 70%, just over 70%. Now, on these assessments, the way they're currently con conceived, is that um, they would be over time, is that correct? Yes, sir. Over how many years? Uh, I believe the proposal, eight, eight, eight years. Eight years. Yeah, eight years, okay. zero percent interest. And then if, of course, we went up. Um, and, and then over eight years, if, they're, if, they're, if people are unable to pay them over eight years, they, they remain as a lien on the property. Is that correct? And under the way they're conceived, they would, that lien would be satisfied only when the property was uh, disposed of. On the sale of. of the property. Right, right, on the sale of the property. We, but we, hopefully we wouldn't get into a lien situation. Right, we don't, we don't want to get into a lien situation, right. Um, so I could go through the whole language, I could get through all the numbers, 
um, and I, but I'll spare you that um, and just say that that is my substitute proposal for a 50-50 split, which is what we're looking at right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Let, let me uh, comment. You know, this is so, to me, so analogous to what we were talking about earlier with trying to help the homeowners the South Side. And this gentleman said it. I mean, it was in the back of my mind before he said it. It was in the back of my mind when I saw your proposal. It's about fairness. It's about fairness. It's not about treating people equal. It's about fairness. And I looked at your proposal, Don, and no matter how you came out with $300 and $1,500, the bottom line is you're willing to take the city from 50% to 70% of the cost. I didn't get your rationale for it, but that's what you're willing to do. Yeah, you know, I, I think the city ought to eat the whole bill. I mean, that's that's really what I feel about it. That's what I do. I, I think they ought to eat the whole bill. I think it's. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not asking for that. Seriously, I'm not. I'm not asking for that. But we're talking about fairness, okay? And we're talking about what's what's equal and what's not equal. And we had the same discussion earlier when we did Southside. And you weren't willing to spend four hundred fifty thousand dollars as the staff had proposed over four years for that development because you wanted to look at something else that's going to be cheaper. But now you've decided that you don't want to, you, you think the city shouldn't do 50%, they ought to do 70%. You haven't given me a rationale why. <laughs> and you've made the numbers work out. But you haven't told me why you want, why, why don't you take it to 80%? Why don't you take it to 90%? There was no rationale in here for what, what you did, other than the fact that you felt that the city ought to pay more. And so why should the city pay more? Because was the city wrong? And we've heard some indications here that the city was culpable in this. And I'm not taking anything away from our staff. I think they've done an excellent job of bringing us to where they are. But we're the final arbiter on this issue. They've given us their best recommendation. They've done it thoroughly. They've studied it. But now we're talking about what, what do we want to do. I think we ought to pay the whole thing. And I think we do it because it's fair and because of the city's role and where what got us to where we are. I mean, you did the numbers. Uh, these people spent about three plus million dollars in property taxes. I, I'm not questioning that. You, you showed me how you did it. They spent about, and the question is, what did they get for it? And, you know, we provided the services. They had police protection, fire protection, garbage protection. They got something. I'm not saying they didn't get anything. But the fact is, they spent that amount of money on taxes on streets that were unreasonable to be in a, in a neighborhood. So my, my sense is if you're going to go 70%, 70%, go 100%. <laughs> and, you know, leave it at that. So that's, that's where I am on this, and I, I appreciate the numbers that you've done. Uh, as I said, I don't see the rationale for why you went from 50 to 70. But you got a good number. You got a good number. It's $300 for the people who have the, the stormwater piece, and it's $1,500 for a lot for people who have the paving and stormwater piece. That's, that's what you got. But I'm saying, you know, I could have said do 80 percent, do 90 percent, or do 100 percent. So, Mr. Mayor, I recognize whoever wants to speak: Councilman Johnson and Councilman Shule, and the Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was wondering if someone could illuminate for us why the 50-50 split was chosen in the first place, and if there are circumstances that have changed to this point that would give us a reason to go to a different split? Well, there was detailed conversation with staff and council back in 2015, a series of work sessions and city council meetings. And um, for the streets in these two subdivisions, it was agreed that there would be a 50-50 split. Now that, that can be changed tonight if that's council's decision. Sure. I, I, th I think it was the council's decision at that point that that's what they viewed as fair. Okay, so I guess I'm not clear from either the mayor's proposal or Don's proposal why a 50-50 split now seems unfair. So if one of y'all could. Yes. Okay, but I'm not asking you, I'm asking them. Well, I, I said my, my rationale for it. My, my, my rationale was that I was there when we did the 50-50. I understood that. But I've given 
additional thought, which I'm entitled to, just like everybody else seems entitled to. And I've come to say, well, why are we going 50 to 70 percent? Don has explained his rationale for it. My rationale is, in terms of fairness, in terms of what the people have been put through, the time involved in it, and what they've gotten in terms of what they've been paying in taxes, uh, Don's proposal says the city puts in $450,000 more. I'm saying, in my opinion, we ought to really treat it fairly and pay the whole bill. That's, that's it. I mean, no, okay. no other rationale behind it. That's, Thank you. That's it. Don, I don't understand your rationale either. Right. So uh, I did want to just address that, um, which is, um, first of all, the most significant change since 2015 is the makeup of the council. So the, the second thing, though, is that, uh, like as the mayor said, we all have an opportunity to continue to consider our situation position. So um, one of the reasons why, why 70, the question was asked, why 70 percent, why not 100 percent? And the answer was, I remembered how difficult it was to get to 50-50 in 2015, and I didn't think I could get it further than 70 percent. So I, 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 I may be well wrong on that. The second answer was, is that we have assessed, um, I did think about the fact that we have assessed Dun Dunwoody Estates that there were people there who did have to pay to help repair <coughs> the streets, and that um, that while the dollar figures here are significantly more, the percentages are significantly less. So I was trying to find the balance of what we've done with other people in the same situation with what I thought council would might be amenable to doing, um, and to what I thought was reasonable and. Um, what I thought was reasonable and fair for the people in the community. I don't know if that helps. Thanks. Yeah. Council McSewell, Judge Kennedy, Council Maurice, and then the Mayor Pro Tem. So I, I guess I have a question for uh, you, Mr. Mayor. Are you saying that you want to, are you talking about when you say uh, pay 100%, are you saying for the stormwater, or are you saying go back and rip up what we've done on the roads as well? And go back to, you know, are you, are you uh, saying no, what, what on I'm, the item what, in front of us now, uh, or are you uh, also saying no, go back to the, to no, the road? Uh, what, what, what I'm saying is that the staff recommendation is here's what the total bill is going to be. And Don just gave you the numbers. The total bill to repair stormwater paving for those two developments is $2.159 plus million. That's the, that's the path. And this, the initial path we were on, well, the city would pick up half of that cost. Mm -hmm and the residents will pick up the other half. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I understood. What I'm saying is that why not pick up the whole piece? Don came up with 70%, and he, came, he told you why. At least he's being honest with you. <laughs> he, wanted, he, he wanted to do something better than 50. He didn't think he'd get much more, so he stopped at 70. And his numbers worked out to the $1,500 and $300. Uh, I'm, I'm saying. So you're, you're saying for you're, you want to do this for both the roads and the stormwater? Yeah, I'm doing, yeah, the okay. stormwater and the paving. It's, you know, it's 2.15. If you're talking about doing something, I mean, you know, you, you, we can always compromise. We can say, okay, just do the paving and let the residents pick up the stormwater. But w what we know is that everybody doesn't have that situation. Ravenstone has 85 lots with unfinished stormwater only. They've got the paving done. But the other two sell, require the stormwater and paving. I mean, that's, that's what the staff report says. And again, my, my knock isn't on the, the staff did what, in their best wisdom, they did. They brought it back to us at the time we were looking at it. We said 50%, 50%. And the staff has brought to us today how it would look at 50-50. Our colleague has looked at it and says, well, not 50, why not 70? And I get the 70 because I think that's about all this council might do because they had, had a change. So I'm saying no, for me, I'd say go ahead and do the 100%. And the rationale is what I said earlier. I think it's fair based on the circumstances and what was involved. So that, that was it. So. Mr. Mayor, so I'd like to offer what I think the rationale for the 50 50 is and why we were at the 50 50. Two, two years ago, when we made the decision, whatever exactly it was. I was there now, though. I know. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I know, I know okay. you were there. Okay. All and, right. You know, we voted for it. Yeah, that's, that's what I said, and I admit we yeah. voted for it. Yeah. Um, and I think the rationale is this. So, 
for um, so we'll just take uh, Dunwoody uh, because it's the case Mr. Joyner cited, but this was our basic philosophy, which is that if you were, and, and we adopted, the council adopted guidelines like this, uh, I believe that we would pick up 10%, Mr. Joyner, of the uh, cost and the residents would pick up 90, is that right? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, at that time, that philosophy was discussed. That was at the beginning of the failed development program. We were faced with 191 projects, uh, over 54 distinct subdivisions. Right. So we decided that basically what happens is people are, you're, you're buying into a subdivision and you're taking a risk and you're taking a risk on that developer. And that developer in these many of these cases, I think we ended up with, you say, 54 of them or something like that. Uh, those, we had 54 developers who weren't able to complete their subdivisions. And so our staff, Mr. Joyner and others, did a great job in trying to find other developers who would take over those subdivisions and develop them, would, would fix up their roads and would fix up the stormwater infrastructure and was successful in, in almost all the cases. Um, and so, but what we had decided at that point was that the, the reason that we had decided that we, this, we, we decided the city would pay a little of it, 10%, and the uh, homeowners would pay the other 90% because the city was not, had, not, had no culpability. In this case, we decided the city does have some culpability because of the, the uh, situation that you all have pointed out about the bonds. Mm -hmm. I do want to say that, and, and uh, Mr. O'Toole can confirm this, I believe, but that was, this bond language was not anything unusual. It was not something that we, uh, the, the city uh, put particularly into this bond package. It was in all bond packages that we had, or it was in all bond language that we had. Um, and uh, it was standard language. It wasn't something that no, you know no one ever used or anything like that. It was uh, it was typical. Uh, there was a judge that ruled against us, and uh, that and so we decided, okay, instead of charging 90 percent to the homeowners, we would charge 50 percent to the homeowners, and the city would assume 50 percent of the responsibility. I think it's further complicated for me by the fact that, I mean, I, I, I really appreciated hearing the stories of, you know, the individuals and, and the hardships that you all face. And I get that. And, um, but I, you know, I, it's complicated for me also by the fact that for people who've moved in recently, of which I can't remember the number, but it's a large number. Um, we, a couple of years ago, um, we looked at the percentage of people who moved in since this thing had started, and it was a pretty high number, and now there are more people who've moved in recently. And it's hard for me to feel like we ought to be paying more than 50%, uh, the city ought to be paying more than 50%, when so many people have moved in recently, and at least in my mind, ought to be able to, you know, are at, should be at risk for this. If you move into the neighborhood in the last couple of years, and you know the situation with the stormwater and, you know, uh, and, the, and, the, and the roads, it seems to clear to me that the city should not assume that risk. And should not, it doesn't seem fair, uh, to use the words that people have used, that the city would, would do that. Um, and so, um, I, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, so we have the taxpayers to think about as well. We have you all to think about who are in the neighborhood, but we also have this large group of, you know, we have all these taxpayers whose money we would have to use to fix this up. And I think we ought to use part of it because I do think the city bears some culpability. You know, exactly is it 50 50, you know, is it 60 40? You know, we could argue about it. But I don't think it's true that the, that the, that the city ought to pay 100% of it. it. It would be generous, but I don't think it's fair because I do think that, 
the people in the neighborhood had a risk, like we all do, uh, when we buy a piece of property. And that, especially for the people that have moved in recently, which is a very large percentage of the neighborhood since this started, I definitely think that there is uh, even uh, more um, uh, responsibility for that risk. So I do think there's a good rationale for the 50-50. And that's what that, that in my mind is what it is. And that's, you know, I would like to say, uh, you know, I, I, I understand the, the impulse to um, make you all whole, but I also think it's not fair to the taxpayers of Durham. We all take risks when we buy property. And I think that that was the situation in this case. The developer did not do what the developer should have done. The city has some culpability for that, and I think that because the city, for the bonds, and because the city has this culpability, I think that the 50 percent is fair. And then I think we're we're give, we're stretching the you know we're we're trying to, uh, given this policy, stretch this out over um, an eight-year payment uh, to try to uh, lighten the load, and um, yeah, so. That's where I okay. recognize Councilman Reese from Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to put some numbers to what we've been talking about for the folks here in the audience um, because I did hear someone at the podium reference an incorrect assessment amount, and I addressed this with a couple of folks by email over the last couple of weeks. The assessment that the staff has recommended for stormwater uh, for folks who live in Ravenstone is $287.81. Um, that uh, count, that comes out to a little less than $36 a year over eight years at zero interest. Uh, that's just for stormwater. So if you're a Ra Ravenstone property owner who has completed streets and is, is just needs the stormwater uh, completion, the proposal before us that the staff has recommended, recommended um, is $287.81. Under Councilmember Moffitt's alternative proposal, Ravenstone homeowners who only need stormwater would pay $300. So let's understand that his goal in this plan was not to ask Ravenstone residents to pay less of an assessment. Actually, you would pay more under either, under whether you have completed streets and only need stormwater, or whether you have a street assessment and stormwater. The goal of Councilmember Moffitt's plan was not to help Ravenstone residents pay less of an assessment because you will pay more under his plan. It was to make Ravenstone and Stonehill residents equal in terms of the assessment they would pay, and then to find an even number that seemed reasonable, 300 streets only, 1,500 streets plus stormwater, and then that gets you back to a 70% contribution from the city. So understand that under the staff proposal um, for streets and stormwater, if I've done my math right, um, the staff is asked, and this is 50% assessment, uh, the total cost for streets and stormwater is $1,214, or a little over $150 what? a year over eight years at zero interest. Councilmember Moffitt's plan would be $1,500 for a, stone, for a home with streets and stormwater to be done. The reason I believe, and I, staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason is it's gonna be a lot more expensive to fix up Stonehill stormwater facilities. They look horrible. I was over there last week. They're just big holes in the ground with trees in them. <laughs> um, and Ravenstone's stormwater facilities actually look like stormwater facilities. They, there's a, they, I mean, it looks like what they're supposed to look like, a, um, a constructed wetland, a detention pond. Um, and so that's the ultimate effect, the real world effect for folks that live in Ravenstone is that Councilmember Moffitt's plan would increase your assessment. Um, the benefit that I believe he's proposing is that it's fairer given that when these developments were created and the original property owners bought their lots, they, it was a random walk whether or not it would in, they would end up in Stonehill or Ravenstone. And so today, property owners, whether you are that buyer or a new successor in interest, that today's property owners should not be penalized for the original buyers, even if that was them, took a random walk uh, and it can't, shouldn't be penalized for which development they ended up. Is that fair? 
Councilman Moffitt. Well, I, I agree with the second part, but I'm not sure I agree with what you were saying about the. I, I agree that the stormwater assessments for Ravenstone, the total assessment for the 85 lots that have stormwater only in Ravenstone, would, those lots would be assessed tw uh, a little over $12 more. But not I, the, the part about the paving. I, I didn't follow that. So, but the second part well, the par about trying is, to mm -hmm. even out the random walk. Yes, I agree with that. Well, this is the, in fairness, Councilman Roth, I asked you for these numbers over the weekend. You said go find them yourself. So that's what I did. Oh, um, no, the, I put them. They're in the spreadsheet I sent you. No, I told no, you which columns are in. Not, not exactly. So, the the assessment per lot on streets for Ravenstone is nine hundred and twenty-seven dollars. That right or wrong? That, that's 50% of the what, what I found in the plan. Uh, Ravenstone for the the proposed assessment for streets mm -hmm. uh, would be $1,945.52, and that is a 50%. That is 50%. Okay. That is 50%. Great. Okay. Yeah, the uh, and on a, to give you a, just a quick list of the numbers. The, un, the, the total assessment per lot for streets for Ravenstone would be $3,891.03. For Stonehill Estates, it would be $2,998.47. That is the unadjusted total. Okay. I, uh, I apologize, Councilmember Moffat. I misread the, what the spreadsheet, what the, that number actually said. I didn't see that column. Um, in any event, uh, so. Forget most of what I just said, because that was wrong. <laughs> um, what I will say is that I applaud Councilmember Moffitt's attempt to come up with some reasonable basis uh, to reach the goal that he's, that he's approached. Um, he obviously spent a lot of time putting, uh, putting this together. Um, and I will consider the other arguments that my council member colleagues make before we vote. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Reese. Sir. Uh, Councilman uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, good evening. I'm looking at a couple who uh, is in bankruptcy. There is another couple who had to leave because the wife just finished uh, treatment for cancer. Uh, and all kinds of situations confront me. And just because of my foundation spiritually, I have to have mercy on on you and what you're going through. So I, I would agree with what the mayor said about 100% uh, for you, but to go back to the other um, development also, and, and they'd have to have the same mercy. But I'm in a state of mercy tonight, and nobody can argue that. That's me. I'm in a state of mercy, and I think um, you have some hardships that we need to be sensitive to. Um, and I'd like to know from somebody in Stormwater what the budget is right now. How much money do we have in Stormwater, in the Stormwater account? We have bukus of money. <laughs> this I know. Yeah, that's the official accounting term. Bukus. <laughs> yes. That's in French. Paul Weepke, Public Works, Stormwater Services. Madam Mayor, for a time, we'd, we'd be happy to get you the fund balance in, in the stormwater budget, but I don't, at this point, I'm not sure that that's a number that Paul's going to have on the back of his, uh, his I back do. pocket. Okay. You have it. I, I doubted you and in, incorrectly. <laughs> do we have money? I believe the question is do we have money to cover the cost for the completion of the stormwater devices in Ravenstone and Stonehill? We do. Case dismissed. Thank you. Well, I'm trying I, to give the right opportunity to uh, speak. We, we do need to be sensitive to the needs of people. I know those of us around here, you know, we don't have to worry about the money, except I'm a, I'm a little different from the rest. But we do need to have mercy. There are times for mercy. And for me, um, that's what I am. That's who I am. And that's what I, I'll be able to sleep tonight because I said that. 
Well, again, it, I'm going to sound like a broken record, so I'm not, not going to say that again. This council can move in any direction that it wants to. That, that's the bottom line. It can move in any direction that it wants to. I, based on where I am, I think 50% is unfair. Don has come up with rationale for 70%. I'm talking about 100%. We've heard that we've got money to cover the stormwater piece in the budget. Uh, to me, if Don is willing to move 70, I'm at 100, I'd be willing to split the difference in terms of where we are. I'm, I'm serious. It's, that's what it's, it's about. How much money is the city willing to pay towards this project, given the history of it and the rationale how we got there? And I'm not faulting the staff, but the fact is the judge ruled against us. I mean, you can count it any way you want. The judge ruled against us. They didn't rule in our favor. You know, so we're culpable, at least by the courts. And that's generally where we go to try to get things resolved. And so, I, I mean, for, for, for me, I, I think a reasonable compromise is if you don't, if you don't do 100%, you don't do 70, split the difference and let the staff figure out what the assessments would be for, for the property owners. And the difference between 70 and 100 is 30. If you split the difference, that's 15. So it would be 85% covered by the city and the property owners would cover 15%. And you let them work the, work the numbers the way, the way they Mayor, can I make a suggestion about a path forward? Sure. Um, the memo prepared by staff has a, certainly has a recommendation, but it provides us with a menu of different options uh, for us to go forward. One of those options is alternative two, city contribution and per lot assessment. And the, um, they offer an option of 100% city contribution. Um, it sounds to me like that is the path that you believe is the proper choice. And I do, but if given that, um, I would recommend, um, I would recommend that you move that option from the menu and see how many votes it gets. Cause I, I don't know how many there are right now. I, I you know, and if that, if that is, uh, is successful, congratulations, um, mercy is achieved. If it's not successful, then we could consider our next options. Is that, well, is that I, fair? Well, I've told you what my, my, my options were. I suggested 100%, but I also said this council can do what it wants. Uh, I've suggested that maybe the compromise might be a diff splitting the difference between John's 7% and my 100%, which is 85% that we would cover. You know, I don't get everything I want. Don doesn't get everything he wants. Nobody gets 50%, and the residents don't get everything they want. And uh, so my... Recognize Councilman Mark. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's two, two things. Um, uh, I, I actually have my spreadsheet here so I can tell you how we can get to 85%. Very close. Um, get your computer but right I wanted there. to ask you a question. Uh, Mr. Joyner, um, one of the things that uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Shul, um, said was that in the beginning, well, I was not on council in the beginning when all this was getting worked out, was that there was a concern uh, that there was um, a large number of failed developments and that the city's liability was significant and that uh, what the council did was adopt a policy limiting saying that the, that, that's, that the city would only participate to 10 percent. Um, that is correct. Okay. Do you remember those dollar figures? So at the beginning there was a lot of unknowns and I'm wondering if you had some sense of the scope and scale of those unknowns. Yes. Yeah, so there wasn't actually a dollar figure attached to that uh, but there was actually uh, so. 191 projects, 54 subdivisions, that will total out to be roughly around 75 miles of streets that needed to be completed in the subdivisions. Uh, around 38 stormwater facilities total that were not completed. Okay. And it represented almost 3,000 homes. Okay. And, um, so, so if no dollar figure attached to it, would you agree that, that it was a significant number of dollars? It was a significant amount, sir. Okay. So, so I, I would, uh, are, then I would just observe that we're now at the end of that process. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There are actually seven subdivisions left. Uh, two of those have complete developer agreements. They are under construction. Two of those are uh, represented here tonight as Ravenstone and Stonehill Estates. And there are three developments that currently 
do not have a deal on the table, although we are working on this. So it would be, is it reasonable to expect that whatever, that the Ravenstone and Stonehill, those are the last of the projects in which some city and dollars uh, or some um, residential dollars are going to be required? So the other three projects are um, which is a 12 lot subdivision. It needs completed streets. Uh, again, it's a small subdivision, 12 lots, and one completed stormwater facility, which is a dry pond. That's very small. Uh, the second development is landings at South Point. That is a private development with private parking lots. It has no public streets that would need completing, and it has uh, three stormwater facilities that are in various stages of completion. Right. Uh, then the third development would be Amberlin Valley Townhomes, uh, and there is a parking lot, a small portion of street that needs to be completed that is public, and there are no stormwater facilities that need to be completed for that. They were all completed as part of the development. So what I was trying to get to was we started out years ago concerned, and after the Great Recession, concerned that there would be a very large city liability, that we were limiting our delight, the city's portion of that liability, and that today, what, I'm, what, I, what I was thinking was, we're now to a place where we know that the city's liability as a whole is less than what we we're trying to limit it to. It is drastically reduced. So, uh, because of the work of your department in getting these projects worked out. So, um, so I can see a logic for saying we're there, we're good, we're in good shape. We can be a little more generous than we set out to be when we were worried about a huge liability for the city's taxpayers. Um, and, and a comment that if we assess nothing for stormwater, and we assess every uh, property which requires street improvements, a total of $800, that will result in an, the city's portion being 84.9% of the total cost. So that is a way to get to that number as well. Well, again, I, I'm, I'm about compromise and trying to find a solution that's fair. Right. Uh, I, I, could, I could support that. And I, I think we've learned a lesson it's an expensive lesson. It's at the cost of the property owners, and it's also at our cost. But we know how to write better bonds now. I mean, you, you, I've heard you say that—that that, you know, we won't—we don't make the same won't make the same mistake we made before. You didn't say that. I, I heard that. <laughs> I, I heard I heard it very clearly that you had learned from this and you had written a better. We're in a position to make sure you had better bonds written by the developers. We have multiple measures in place, yeah. not just the bonds um, to but, try But and, it, it and came as a result of this. It came as a result of this. That, that's a lesson learned. It, but not for this, we never would have learned that. I, don't, well, I shouldn't say we wouldn't. But for this, we did do this. We're in a better position. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, what are we talking about here? We're talking about, let's see, 100% of the, of the um, of the stormwater is, and I'm sorry, my seven hundred and thirty-eight thousand three hundred and sixty-five dollars. Last couple of pages of my memo aren't coming in. So, what is that number? Seven hundred. The stormwater alone, mm -hmm. total co total cost, mm -hmm. is seven hundred and thirty-eight thousand three hundred sixty-five dollars. Okay, Robert, or I guess whoever is knows about the streets. What's the street number? Uh, the street number. What would be a hundred percent of the street cost? One million four hundred twenty thousand nine hundred forty dollars. This is do you want the unrecovered cost? No, I want the one hundred percent. One million four hundred twenty thousand nine hundred forty-five dollars. That's unrecovered. That's after the bond money is applied. That's correct. Okay, so say it again. Uh, so the total cost is roughly about one point eight five. Well, and after the after the uh, securities are applied to it, it would be uh, just over 1.4. 1.4. 1.4. 4. So 1.4 million in in street, uh, so tax money, and 760 something in stormwater fee money. So 2.1, 2.1 2 
$2.2 million. Just shy of two point two, I believe. We're talking about money that the city has to spend, and that's why I said we spend $1.4 million for paving that the city would have to spend, and the bonds would cover the other 800 whatever that number is. So out of pocket for the city is $1.4 million plus million dollars to cover the paving. Out of pocket expenses for the city to cover stormwater is $738 plus thousand dollars. They're the numbers we're working with. And Don, can, can you say again what, what your proposal is? Well, the... the, the Just say what you, what you propose. That's the, I'm, the, my original proposal... No, I'm not talking about oh, the original. I'm talking about the one where we came... To, where, to 85%. Yeah, yeah. It is to, for the city to pay the entire cost of the uh, stormwater facilities yeah. and to um, assess the lots in Ravenstone and Stonehill Estates which need road improvements to assess them $800 a piece. Um, that, but that's the proposal. And I guess, I'm going to do it on my calculator, but what is the total cost to the city with this proposal? So if we do that proposal, the city's share would would be, if, if the costs come in, what they're estimated to be, the costs would be one, just over $1.8 million. It's $800 times 221 lots plus 187 lots, right? So the, the um, exactly. that's correct. Okay. So and if we look at that number. So the, the 800 times all of the lots which need road improvements, that's $326,400. Uh, if I may, uh, just add just one small uh, item in there. I'd like to remind everyone that the stormwater has not actually been bid yet, so we are talking about dollars, and the final numbers for the paving have not come in yet. Although that work has been bid and the project is almost complete, we, we would expect those numbers uh, relatively soon after uh, we've got the final pay invoices yes. in from the contractor, so I just want to remind everyone uh, I'm, about the final numbers. I'm hearing you say that the paving costs you have a pretty good estimate on, the stormwater you have a little less confidence in the estimates so far. Uh, that work has not been bid. Right. <laughs> right. It's estimated. Right. So you want to put that in the form of a motion? I, I, I wish I had a better reading on how much support it well, would get. Well, the point is that, I but, mean, I, I guess I'm trying to go where so, Charlie was. Charlie's one is to vote on her to see where the votes were. I'm saying vote on the compromise to see where it is. Okay. Simple as that. So, um, so the first thing we, w w the first goal of the staff tonight is to get us to order, just move forward with the improvements to the stormwater facilities. Is that correct? Tonight, it's really just to get a recommendation for staff so that they could move forward with an agenda item hmm. okay. for council to order the work. So, for stormwater only. Okay, it says city council direct public works to schedule notice public hearing. Cost to complete will be paid through a combination of assessments. So, I'm going to recommend that we move forward from here with assessments that would be, that we would. Um, we would not assess any of the residents of Ravenstone or Stonehill Estates for stormwater improvements. Then these are not final, right? We've already, we're watching things change as we go. But the, 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 at this moment, we're saying we will not assess them for any stormwater improvements and that we would assess each of the homeowners which are on lots which require road improvements that those homes would be assessed $800 a piece. Could, could we 
let's step back from that a little bit. Yes. So if council elects tonight to 100% fund the stormwater completion, uh. then the work doesn't need to be ordered. You're just telling public works, go do the work with city money. Okay. As far as the streets, that work has been ordered and it was ordered with the idea that there would be a 50-50 cost share. You, council does not ultimately need to stick with that recommendation. Right. So what would happen with that is the streets, the street work is currently being done. Public Works is gonna put all of that cost information together. If you move forward with a direction to cap street assessments at $800, when Public Works brings forward the final assessment for the streets, that could be the way the final assessment for streets reads. But you're saying we don't need to talk, we don't need to do that right now. No, I, I think it would be good if you yeah. gave a recommendation to Public Works, move forward and fully fund the stormwater work, and then when you're done with the streets in these two subdivisions, bring forward a final assessment capped at eight hundred dollars per lot. If that's if that's what council wants to direct staff to do. Okay. Could I ask? Questions. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, Mr. Joyner, how long they'll have how many years to pay that? Uh, the current proposal is eight years. At zero percent. At zero percent interest. Is that is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and again, when the streets work was ordered, that was the proposal, a 50-50 cost share, paid over eight years, zero percent interest. When these assessments are finally ordered, Council would give the final order for how the how assessment much? is being handled. So if it's no more than eight hundred dollars per lot, and then you could say payable over eight years, zero percent interest, if that's what council wants mm -hmm. to do. Okay. <coughs> that one one hundred percent. That's good. Do I have to make the motion? No. Oh. I'll, I'll <laughs> make the motion. Go on. Well, I, w I would move that we cap the lots at eight hundred dollars we'll cap it at eight hundred dollars and use the rationale that don gave a few minutes ago for paving for paving for paving for paving for paving and storm water is free i mean it's 100 percent. Right. so the motion is that we cap the paving fee to eight hundred dollars per lot and that the city be responsible for paying all the storm water um, payments is that Yes, sir. I'll second, second the motion. Okay. I just want to make one more comment before we... Sure, and recognize this assistant Just before adoption, I, I, I think staff is clear on what council's proposing. I do want to uh, offer clarifying comments to Mr. Wibke's response about the ability of the stormwater budget to absorb the costs. He is correct. There is fund balance that is able to absorb these costs, but I don't want to leave council with the impression that that might not have some future impact on the stormwater fund. Uh, that fund is rebalanced each year. Uh, to plan for the expenses that come from that pro uh, from that fund, capital projects, and so the rates are set each year and recommended to council. Uh, there is the ability to pay for it, but I don't want to leave the impression that that would have no impact. I'm sure council's aware of that, but I just wanted to state that for clarity. Thank you. And that impact would be that we would pay more to cover, that everyone would pay more to cover future costs. Yes. We keep paying. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, we've got a motion and a second. We have a question by Councilman Shule. I just have a comment, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I uh, just want to say that I'm going to vote against this. I, I appreciate the impulse behind it, um, but I, I really feel pretty strongly that this is a shared responsibility. I don't think it's true that the city is 85% should be paying 85% and, and takes should take 85% of the responsibility. Um, I especially feel true that's true of the do, you know scores dozens you know I don't know I can't remember that I wish we you know it'd be nice to have this number in front of us as we did the last time we deliberated uh, that new people moving into the neighborhood since this has happened. I can't imagine why it is our responsibility, especially for them, to be paying 100% of the 
the fee. Um, so I understand the impulse, uh, but I feel pretty strongly that our taxpayers and ratepayers are should not be paying 100% of this. I think that the 50% split uh, seems fair. Uh, I understand that. I understand the generous impulse behind the the 85%. Uh, I just wanted to state how I'll be voting. I can recognize Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I agree with Councilmember Schul that I'll also be voting against this. And I think I just wanted to say I feel like this is an example of privatizing a benefit while socializing a cost. Instead of the homeowners covering 50% of the cost, we're shifting that cost onto the taxpayers of Durham at large. I'm willing to do that when there's, when there's a clear public purpose. And a couple of my colleagues have brought up the housing stabilization grants that we voted for earlier today. In that case, I believe that there's a clear public purpose in neighborhood stabilization um, in a situation where people have been subject to these very severe waves of price appreciation, and that we are, and that we are trying to, um, that we are trying to keep neighborhoods stable, right? In a in a very different way than just paying for for incomplete infrastructure in a particular community. I feel like like Councilman Schulz's rationale for a 50-50 split is the most reasonable argument that I've heard up here tonight. The city is responsible and the homeowners are responsible. I don't understand why you think you're not responsible at all. I mean, I think, I think the, I understand. I understand everyone's upset. I, w I wasn't here in 2015, so I don't have the context for this issue that other folks, that other members of council have. But I, but I don't think that we came to, that 50-50 was a bad decision. I honestly don't know why we're going back and saying something else. I am I can count to four, so I'm aware that this is going to pass tonight, but I do wanna say I do not think it's fair for taxpayers of Durham to be asked to pay for a benefit that will primarily accrue to a few individuals at an 85% level. I think it is completely reasonable for the city and for y'all to share the responsibility. And I understand why you wouldn't wanna pay anything. If I was in your position, I wouldn't wanna pay anything either. But my dis but what we're trying to do is make public policy. Uh, uh, no, can, no, no, no. We're talking can, about going can, back and changing quiet, your assessments call, completely. Quiet it down, please. Councilman, going Councilman back Johnson and has a, Councilman Johnson, just a minute, please. Just a minute. Yeah. Respect her comments, please and ability to, to say that. Go ahead. If we go back and both cap the street assessments, right, that's the maximum that you'll pay, is $800. So, so is, I mean, <laughs> so no, you're not already paying the street assessments, right? Like, the, we're going back and, and undoing what council did before and replacing it with another, with another option. Again, that's what's gonna happen, but to me it feels like we're taking taxpayer money and giving it to a small group of people and that everyone will pay for that. Everyone in the city will pay for that. So I would be comfortable with them paying for, for half of the responsibility, but I'm not comfortable with them paying for 85% of it. Are there further comments? If not, I'm gonna call the question. Is everybody clear on the motion? Yes. Okay. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote, please? Open the vote. Close the vote. It passes four to three with Council Member Johnson voting no, Council Member Reese voting no, and Council Member Shure voting no. All right, let's move to any other items to come before the council tonight. Where's the Thirty three? Where's thirty three? Oh, yes. Thank you. This was brief. I'm sorry. This is on. Um, the reason I pulled this item is that I got an anonymous letter. So oh. I, I didn't have a way to address it, but to ask staff to answer, to see if they could answer the questions. Uh, this includes uh, sidewalk repairs downtown. And the question is, I'm sorry I didn't send this to you earlier. I just opened it up. I think I got it uh, today. All the sidewalk on the north and east side of City Hall is being replaced. So I don't know if that's true, but that's what the letter says. Even though some of the sidewalk appears to be very new, what makes this project a high priority for limited sidewalk repair dollars? 
Good evening, Tasha Johnson, Public Works Assistant Director. So that particular location had several service requests and it had been identified through um, citizen concerns over the last couple of years. And so as we developed the project, we looked to identify locations that had uh, a backlog of service requests as well as a high pedestrian um, use. Okay. The, the next question they asked would be, is would this sidewalk be removed and replaced if the city does the two-way loop project? I don't think so. I don't think the two-way loop project should have very much construction associated with it, but I'll have to look to transportation to confirm that. Okay. Uh, Bill Judge with transportation. Yeah, the concept behind most of the loop project would be to maintain the curb lines in the existing location, so it should have minimal impact on the sidewalk. Okay, thank you. The next question they asked was, are there greater sidewalk repair needs elsewhere in the city's neighborhoods and even downtown in places like Church Street? So we have uh, quite a bit of sidewalk repair need throughout the city. Um, there are locations throughout the whole city that we could look to um, for future projects. And what we are trying to do is uh, spread them across a geographic area across the city, as well as identify locations that have, have high pedestrian activity. Great. So. Thank you very much. We do have another number of other sidewalk repair projects in the hopper for repairs all around the city, so this work is in addition to several other projects. Thank you. I want to appreciate you for staying so late, for answering the questions, and Mr. Mayor, if no one has any co other comments, I'll move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Go ahead. Open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, I need to ask for an excuse absence from work session Thursday. So move. Second. It's been brought and moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. It passes yeah. seven to zero. Thank you. Any other items to come no, before sir. the council? No. If not, council is adjourned at 10.35 p.m. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That was kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally awesome. But I see that. Yeah, I think the rest of the time is right to move the point.